Yeah, that I'm not at all talking about intent. I'm just I, talking about the results. I'm talking about like, let's just look at where people have ended up. There's some research to show that when women enter a highly paid field, the pay level tends to decrease. Like in the case of veterinarians, when that went from being a majority male job to a majority female job. I, there, there, there also may be a factor of if a lot of women start joining a particular field, then it becomes valued less by the marketplace. You are tuning in to The Multiversity, a podcast for higher dimensional education. Join us as we explore philosophy, science, history, and the great unknown. Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us on this week's episode of The Multiversity as we take on the extremely controversial and very dicey topic of gender bias. To briefly introduce myself, I'm Katie. I am a woman. I'm Arielle. I am also a woman. Is that all we have to say? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a <Kurt>, man. <laughs> I'm Kurt, and uh, I don't know what to think about this. I'm Chris, and I like to take calculated risks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, hopefully we've calculated this well enough. Um, today's focus is going to be primarily on gender bias in the workplace, um, particularly we're talking about in the Western world. And we're going to be looking at evidence of gender bi bias and asking some big questions like, is gender bias partially or even primarily to blame for the disparities that we see in men and women's career attainment? And with that, can some of the differences in outcome be attributed to inherent differences between men and women? Uh, we're also going to be examining our own biases a little bit, and we'll be talking about how this conversation relates to broader issues of sexism, gender equality. Uh, as a starting point, we're going to be talking a little bit about the July tw 2017 Google internal memo by James Damore. That was a piece of writing which really thrust a lot of these issues front and center. James Damore was at the time a Google engineer who wrote a memo criticizing some of Google's gender inclusivity policies. And he proposed basically that perhaps much of the reason for Google's majority male workforce was due to inherent differences between men and women, and maybe shooting for equality of outcome in this regard was a lost cause. He paid a very big price for this memo, basically set off a media and Twitter storm and got fired. We all read this memo this week. Uh, what did we What did we think? What did you guys think well, about it? I think a lot of the stuff he says seems to be quite reasonable, like he's, he's just talking about for one thing, he's saying that they need to be open in discussing it, like they can't just shut off areas of debate because it's politically incorrect to do so. And that, that kind of makes sense. Another thing is, this is an internal document, so it's a little hard to know exactly where everything fits in because we don't have the context of working there. Yeah, and another thing is that it's kind of ironic, I guess, that he got fired because he talks about in the memo about how people are afraid to speak up in Google because they're afraid of being fired. And so, of course, that's exactly what happened to him. Uh, so that mm. by, by doing that, they did kind of prove his point. <laughs> and he also gives these other suggestions where you can try to address the, the issues that people are concerned about without doing it in with uh, positive discrimination or something like that. Yeah, so, so basically for a little bit of context, right now or as of 2018, which is the most recent statistic I could find, 30.9% of Google's employees were women. And that number has basically been static since 2014. It's changed like less than half of a percentage point, even though according to James Damore in this memo and I'm sure it's true that Google has made a lot of efforts to recruit more female employees and also had programs specifically for women within the company for retention and things along those lines. Lots of gender diversity training and, and things like that. And um, yeah, James Damore was basically saying 
maybe we can't expect to get to 50% even if even if we put a lot of effort into trying even if we're not discriminating well and he i think he also says we could get to 50% if we if we had an honest conversation about these things and and actually uh did things differently to encourage more women to join Google. Um, because basically what he says is that there's this kind of natural or biological inclination of men towards more, um, towards things, whereas women have a more natural in- inclination towards, and this is of course on average, you know, there's a, there's a wide distribution. And of course there are women who are a little bit more on the thing side and women who are more on the, the people side and the same thing for men. But, uh, you know, if you're if you're trying to if you're trying to cause this this macro effect where you know you, you want more women, then uh, you have to implement some kind of macro policy. And so he brings up things like we should do more pair programming because women like collaborating, and we should do more. You know, um, women are uh, generally when they do become developers, they like to do they go into front end development because that's the the people facing side. Uh, rather than back end. And so if we just did, you know, had more of those jobs or something, then probably we could have more women. Yeah, like um, I agree with what Chris and Kurt said, that it was pretty ironic that he got fired and that that points to um, some major cultural discomfort with a lot of these questions that hopefully by talking about them open and honestly now we'll address. Uh, but to get to, um, there's a few different levels to look at it. Like there's that level to look at it and there's a level of like, I, like reading that memo, I can understand why a lot of the what, female engineers at Google would have been pissed or upset mm-hmm. by it. Like those, yeah, I can I can understand that. And also, there's the level at the actual claims he's making about gender differences themselves. Like, how do we evaluate those claims? Which I'd really be interested in talking about. Yeah, that that's that's definitely something that we'll dig into. I did find the memo. I found it ironic that he was fired for it. I could tell while reading the memo that he was being very careful with his language and using a lot of caveats and trying to not be just brazenly offensive while while writing it. It did come across a little bit condescending at, at times towards women. If I, if I was a female engineer, I, I don't know if I would have been extremely happy reading that memo. I, and that's the thing, you know, maybe we'll have to evaluate these claims because maybe he's kind of right. But to say, well, if we if we want more female engineers, then we need to have more front facing roles and we should ha- make it more collaborative and more team like and we need to. I, I don't know, it was it was kind of that that's the condescending part. It it, it, it felt like that a little bit. I, I don't know. But really? That's the whole weird thing about it, because the Google from the beginning is trying to do this thing like, hey, we're, we're not going to necessarily look at women on their merits, but we're going to hire them anyway, which is, that's the, the greater context. And that's really the more condescending thing. Yeah, that, that, that's condescending too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. I, think, I think you got to be a little bit careful because I don't think affirmative action necessarily means that they'll just hire any woman who stumbles through the door. Like there still is a merit-based element, but it's not 100% merit-based in that case, yeah. Yeah, or it's it's valuing gender diversity as a merit in and of itself. Right. I mean, as far as as far as James Demore's claims go, I'm fairly I'm fa- like, I'm fairly skeptical about some of the um about some of the conclusions he draws. Like it's really it's really important that for this whole conversation when we're looking at a lot of these claims of gender difference, like the reality is when people do these personality tests and stuff like that and interest tests on men and women, they find differences. But what people like James Damore do is they take those findings and they say, therefore, these differences are heritable. Therefore, these differences are caused by X and Y. And it's actually extremely difficult to pinpoint the cause of these gender differences. That, that's why there's this controversy. It's not like the science clearly shows that there's these gender differences and they're clearly all, her- all genetically based or hormone based and that's why they exist. If, that, if the science so clearly said that, there would not be this controversy. The problem is there are these gender differences that we observe in girls and boys and in men and women, and we don't know what causes them. We don't know if they're caused socioculturally or if they're caused biologic. 
well, I shouldn't say biologically because I think that's misleading as well. Just say genetically. We don't know if they're caused genetically by prenatal hormones, by um, adult hormones, or by sociocultural factors. So it's really, really important to keep that distinction in mind. And I think that's somewhere where James Damore's memo, the actual claims he's making, and even if his claims are inaccurate, I don't think that means he should be silenced. But I think that's where we can look at some of the claims that James Damore is making and say that say that they're questionable. Well, I, I think it's clear that, and this is just a, a classic nature versus nurture argument, which, which things, how much of it is due to nature, how much of it is due to nurture. Whenever I have these, these discussions with people, I think it's pretty clear to both sides usually that some is due to nature and some is due to nurture. And the question is just how much, right? So I, I don't think that Damore is making the claim that all of the differences uh, or all of the reason, yeah, all, all of the, um, yeah, the reason why Google has more males than females is due to some biological difference. But I think he's, he's saying maybe, maybe more is due to that than we're willing to admit. He, he makes the claim at the beginning that the differences are highly heritable. Those are his exact words. Yeah. And he also does not bring up or really acknowledge any any of the evidence for gender discrimination in the workplace, nor does he really talk about the social factors that might be causing these differences to occur. Some of the specific claims that he talks about, which are pretty uncontroversially true that we see these effects, but he talks about extroversion expressed as gregariousness rather than assertiveness, saying that women have a harder time negotiating salary, asking for raises, speaking up, higher neuroticism, higher anxiety. He says he thinks that that's why women say in their internal surveys that they're having a harder time with the jobs. He says men have a higher drive for status, women have a higher drive for family, things along these lines. And that he's basing that on internal surveys, he said. In terms of the neuroticism, he was talking about internal surveys where women who were working at Google were rating their experience is lower, I believe. In, in terms of the personality differences, it's also important to note that the, the tenor of his suggestions are geared towards accepting these personality differences and working around them rather than trying to change them, even though there's a lot of evidence that stuff like assertiveness training for women has a really big, a really big positive impact for women in the workplace. Is like He's not even going there. He's like, nope, women are more um, women are less assertive, women are more agreeable, and we just got to work around that in the workplace and come what may. Yeah, well, well he, I think he's just trying to suggest a couple of things and say, well, let's, let's try this. He's not necessarily, you know, saying this is the only way. But no, but he, no, but he, all, all, of his, all of his suggestions and the whole memo is based on the assumption that these differences are largely heritable and unchangeable. Which is fine. That's his perspective. Like, I don't think there's anything wrong with him putting forward that perspective and people responding to it. But I do think it's important to point out that that assumption is very questionable and that that assumption does gear all the suggestions he's made. Like, it, it does shape all the suggestions he's making. Well, he, he does say, yeah, so I guess women, women being more assertive or less assertive is something that could be trained. It, it does seem like nature does impart a, a certain amount of... Uh, yeah, like a like a certain proclivity towards assertiveness at birth, and then you know you can you can train that away if you want. Um, but he does say, I, I don't think he's saying that people don't have bias and that discrimination doesn't happen. He says at Google we're regularly regularly told that implicit and explicit biases are holding women back in tech and leadership. Of course, men and women experience bias tech and the workplace differently, and we should be cognizant of this. But it's far from the whole story. So he, he's, I think he's, he's recognizing that, uh, that, that, that nurture is a component and that it, it can help. But I think he's saying, but we need to not ignore the nature component because it's important, because it's significant. One thing is also, even if we accept that these are cultural factors, that doesn't necessarily change them. Like if, we'd still have to find a way to account for the cultural factors. Do you, do you see where I'm going with this? Well, sure. But Google 
was doing things to try to account for the cultural factors, like having more gender inclusivity, having implicit bias trainings and things like that. And that's a lot of what James Damore was criticizing in this memo. He was kind of saying, we shouldn't be doing these things. If we want to have more women, if that's the goal, he was kind of saying we should create a more social environment to attract more women. Well, that sounds pretty was, cool to me, but <laughs> doesn't it sound cool to have a more social office like for well, anybody? Yeah, it, it does sound cool. It does sound cool to me, but he was, he was basically discounting the, the potential impact of having bias training or, 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 or saying, maybe he wasn't saying that it played no role. He, he did acknowledge that it played some role, but the, the purpose of his memo was basically to criticize Google and say, we should be focusing on these other areas, not so much on the bias. Well, and, and I think yeah. it's, it's possible that maybe he just hadn't heard of assertiveness training. Uh, this is the first that I've ever heard of that. Uh, that sounds useful. Um, I think, but I think his larger point was that the, the strategies that Google was employing were actually more harmful than helpful. Um, because they were introducing this kind of reverse sexism. And yeah, that was causing a lot of unnecessary uh, animosity. So why don't we kind of look into, talk about some of these, these claims about gender differences or maybe inherent sex differences between men and women. Ariel, you were saying that maybe a lot of these things are more nurture-based, but there there does seem to be some some evidence of nature-based sex differences, but particularly in what he was saying that women tend to be more interested in people and men tend to be more interested in things. There's evidence of that. There's also been studies on Reese's monkeys and other primates, for example, that indicated similar preferences for baby monkeys the male well, monkeys would, liking to play with wheeled toys and the females liking to play with doll-like toys. You guys all, everyone reads that study wrong. It's crazy. Like we all read that study. That article that we read also read that study and everyone reads it wrong. That is not what the study said. The study said the boys' monkeys are more likely to play with wheeled toys and the girl monkeys are equally likely to play with wheeled toys or uh, the plush doll toys. So it's actually a little bit more nuanced than just the boys play with the boy toys and the girl play with the girl toys. It indicates a... a seeming gender preference for the boy monkeys, but um, ambiguity as far as the girl monkeys go. And there was an earlier study on macaque monkeys, um, vervet monkeys, not vervet monkeys, uh, and the vervet monkeys, in that one, they got the, the girl monkeys playing with the girl toys and the boy monkeys playing with the boy toys. Um, so that is some evidence that there could be a gender difference in at least the male preference for... Um, what exactly is the, the misreading there? The How misreading, did we misunderstand that? Well, the misreading is, is Katie and a lot of people who read that study about the rhesus monkeys, their takeaway seems to be the boy monkeys play with the boy toys. Like the, is it, okay, basically to, to summarize the study, what they did is they, get, they put a pile of toys in a room with a bunch of juvenile rhesus monkeys and they went to see, they, they were looking, studying which sex chose which toys, if there was a sex difference in which toys the monkeys chose to play with. And what they found was the male monkeys picked up the, the trucks and the, the, the toys that had a lot of mechanical components, whereas the female monkeys were equally likely to choose the mechanical toys or the, the girly toys. So that's like the dolls. Right. I don't and see he, how, how, how any okay. of us or Katie misunderstood that study. Okay, okay, well, the, reason, the, the reason that, understanding is that women are more likely to choose the dolls and boys are more likely to choose the mechanical toys but without yeah. noting that women were equally likely to choose the mechanical toys or the dolls. So basically right. they're, they're more likely the than the monkeys to choose the, the dolls more likely no. than the men or the, no. or the boy monkeys. No, they're not. The, 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 the well, yeah, yeah, they're more likely than the male monkeys to pick the dolls, but they, the female, mon the, the girl monkeys, the juvenile female monkeys were equally likely to cho choose the wheel toys or the plush toys. They did not have a gender preference in terms of which toys they picked. So the girl right. monkeys didn't pick the girl toys, which is how it's usually what? They were more likely than the girl monkeys to, sorry, they were, the girl monkeys were more likely than the boy monkey, monkeys to pick the girl toys. The, the, yeah, the but they didn't boy exclusively... monkeys had a, had, a, had a negative preference. For so the girl so can, I, can I ask you a question? Because I, I definitely did misread that and it, it might be 
because of the the articles that I was reading about it that I misinterpreted it. But did you read? Just the don't understand why this is relevant. It is relevant. That's very relevant. Uh, well, because, it's, it's, it's because it shows a bias in how everyone's reporting on the study. Yeah, one. it's it's one. It's a very different conclusion with different implications. But I'm curious. Do you know Ariel if it was that? an individual girl monkey would play with the mechanical toys and the plush toys, or was it like half of the girl monkeys played with the mechanical toys and half of them played with the plush toys? I'm not completely sure. I think it was kind of whichever monkey grabbed which toy first. I think that's how they did it, but actually I, I, I'm not sure. So I shouldn't really say. Okay. That would be an interesting thing. That, that, that does, that would imply something like, women are interested in people and things and men are more interested in things. However, still the conclusion I think would be that if you're, if you're really, really specializing and only interested in mechanical things, then you're probably more likely to want to go into a thing oriented field than someone who's more well-rounded. I, I think you would still have a similar effect there. Yeah, yeah, and that's, that's something interesting that they find when they look at, like, um, high school students is one thing they find is a lot of the boys who are really good at math, they, they, they find that there's often an equal number of boys and girls who are really good at math, but of the boys who are really good at math, they tend to be only really good at math, whereas the girls who are really good at math tend to also be strong in um, other areas like linguistic skills. And so mm -hmm. they posit that sometimes as a reason why there's fewer girls in um highly mathematically specialized disciplines is just because the girls have more options. But again, yes, you know, when, when you, when you read stuff like this, you got to really be careful because you hear about that difference and you're like, Oh, there's a gene where boys are better, where boys only are good at math. And, you, but you know, you, there's no, they haven't found any of these genes. Like they, they like, like there's, there's some things they can do where they like, basically, and just to, to, to make a long story short, there's methodological problems in trying to figure out whether these things are environmental or genetic. They, they have a lot of problems with that. It's really hard. So when we talk about these things, like the, you can look at something like the monkey study and say, clearly that points to a gender difference in, in interests. And it likely does. Like the monkey study likely does. It's strong evidence for that. And I don't want to discount that. But I also think you still got to be careful and approach it with a level of uncertainty. Because you see like um, those studies, like the one with the rhesus monkeys had like 30 30, um, it was N equals 30. The one with the vertebrate monkeys was N equals 60. So very small sample sizes. And you also got to note, like, gender roles across different primates vary a lot. Like, if you look at our closest relatives, like the chimps and the bonobos, like, the chimps have um, an extremely brutal patriarchal social structure where the men are, the, the male chimps are very brutally dominant over the females, and it's a very violent society versus the bonobos where it tends to be, it's a little bit oversimplification. This is a bit of an oversimplification, but the bonobos, they tend to be more matriarchal and cooperative. So you, 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 got, you got to be careful in, in... Well, that's, that's a different discussion, and we can... Well, well no, but the, the, point, the, point I, the point I was making is that gender roles differ across primates, so it's not totally clear to what extent you can, to what extent the differences... Like, it's a, it's a strong piece of evidence. Yeah. I'm not trying to deny that, and it's I do also, think... There, there, is, there, are, there have also been experiments done on infant human children that have also showed stereotypical sex preferences when it comes to toy choice. Well, and, and my point There's is just- the possibility that the, the experimenters are somehow influencing the, the subjects, like their expectations affect what they do. And there's also, I'd also be cautious because presumably in this study with the rhesus monkeys, they separate the male monkeys from the female monkeys and when they're mixed together, they might actually have different behavior. That's a good point. Uh, I think that they were all they were all mixed together, and they were all grabbing at the toys. Okay. The study enough. design was, which also opens up like it's possible the male monkeys were stronger and were able to grab the toys they wanted first and stuff like that. So it's a little there are complications, and 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 I mean I'm not trying to discount this piece of evidence, because it is a strong piece of evidence for the biological, the, the genetic argument. I'm not trying to discount that. I'm just trying to say, you got to be careful looking at this evidence sometimes, because there's always more than one way to interpret it. Right. So, so my, my point was going to be that, so if, if say, say that, that the monkey study is applicable to humans, 
And women have a, an equal preference for people and things, and men have a, a strong preference for things over people. So if we have you know, a, a graph of uh, you know, on, on one side is things and on one side is people, then you know, women are gonna, be, are gonna have this normal distribution, right? Where the middle is right over the middle of the graph, right? And then men are going to be, you know, off on the things side of the graph, and they're going to have a normal distribution that's that's um, that's offset to the to the things side. And so, um, regardless of whether that people are people are reading that study wrong and thinking that uh, women prefer, you know, on average prefer people over things, when really it's an equal preference for both things, that still means that on average men prefer things more than women do. And on average, women prefer people more than things. Uh, sorry, more than, more, than men more than men do. Yeah, sorry, I did that wrong. <laughs> but I mean, so, that's, that's, that's certainly one way to interpret that study, but it's, it's still important to report the right, study accurately. Right. And, I, well, and, I, and I thought that it was interesting how you brought up that uh, maybe the, maybe you, you, you kind of suggested, well, maybe, the, maybe all of the monkeys really wanted the cool toy, like the, you know, <laughs> The, the wheeled toys, you know, the trucks and stuff. And the boys were just stronger and bullied the girls out of playing with them. And so that's why, that's why the, 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 the girl monkeys preferred to play with the, with the doll toys because there wasn't as much fuss over those. So that, that, might, be, uh, that might be, you know, uh, uh, the analogy in the human world would be, well, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe everybody just really wants those programming jobs and the men are just, they just have more power. And so, uh, they're taking those jobs when the women, women really want them to. Anecdotally, I've known some people who were in tech recruitment and who specifically wanted to recruit women, and they had a very difficult time finding women to fill tech, tech jobs that, that, were, that were qualified. Or they, they, had, they had a very difficult time finding enough female candidates anywhere close to what they wanted. I, I don't think it's yeah. that men and women are really, really competing for tech jobs and... Well, the counter case to that would be like, if this is a, re a real deeply ingrained cultural thing, then it would be happening way before that. Mm -hmm. Like there would be so many filters. Like, like I, I know <laughs> engineering students, uh, mostly male, and they can be, it's a real lads club. Like they do all sorts of weird things. Like they play games where they... <laughs> go to go to bars and play drinking games and do all I won't go into the details but they do all kinds of obscene things I can see how that culture wouldn't be welcoming to a lot of women it that's is a little a bit, yeah yeah that, that's true and it is a little bit weird too to break into something when there's not a lot of women in it like I can say just personally speaking when I was in math classes as a kid taking or in high school, like in calculus classes and things. I I was in a college course where there were 40 students and I was the only girl. And then I was in another one where there were 40 students and there was one other girl in it. And it, it was a bit uncomfortable. <laughs> it was a bit uncomfortable because it's just, it, is that, not only are you interested in taking the course, but is that an environment that you're going to want to be in if you're thinking about majoring in something in college? Is it the social environment that, that you're going to be in? Yeah, and, and definitely yeah. As, as soon as a, like any kind of organization becomes unbalanced and becomes really male-heavy or, or really female-heavy, that obviously changes the culture and, and self-reinforces and makes it less welcome for the other, the other sex. Um, I, I actually think that um, I was recently having a conversation about Bitcoin and how uh, it's very, very male-centric and women are finding it hard to... Uh, sort of break into that um, because, yeah, because it's kind of this boys club as, as Kurt was talking about. Uh, but on the other hand, Bitcoin is a protocol. <laughs> it, it, it really, it literally does not care what your gender is, what your sex is, who you are, what your race is, where you're from. It, it treats everybody exactly the same. And so since it's heavily male, I would say that's pretty strong evidence that men are, are choosing to uh, to get involved because they're interested in it and women are choosing to do so less. There are, there are a lot of women uh, in Bitcoin doing a lot of cool things, but it is uh, predominantly male right now. So that might change, but that's just how it is. 
Well, to get back to the question of tech and hiring, and also, Chris, I, I think, you know, Bitcoin still exists in a human culture where it's spread through word of mouth and stuff like that. And that definitely is subject to the vagaries of, of human culture and I mean, pattern and habit. The what? It's spread through the internet. Yeah, yeah but, through, yeah, but who you communicate form. with on the internet is related to, to your communities and stuff. I mean, it could, it could be if they're, if they're, uh, if, I mean, unless they're anonymous communities, which a lot of times in, in the Bitcoin community, they are, they're just pseudonymous handles. So you really can't tell whether the other person is a male or a female. Um, so, I mean, you often can though. You, you, you definitely often can. And if you're on the internet and in one of these pseudonymous communities and you make it clear that you're a woman, you're, you often face harassment. Well, yeah, but I mean, yes. And that's very unfortunate. Um, but again, you can just not do that if you don't want. <laughs> right. You can just pretend to be a guy. Yeah. <laughs> sure. That's really People welcoming to women. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, you have to guys do, there at all. <laughs> change something about your identity. You fit right in. <laughs> all right. Well, so that's a different conversation. I mean, yeah, boys clubs tend to be kind of boys clubs. And yeah, uh, boy, boys treat girls differently than they treat boys. And I think girls treat boys differently than they treat girls. So I think everybody does that. I mean, to, to get back to the issue of um, gender, of tech, tech, tech in the workplace again, because Katie brought up an anecdotal story. And I think it's really important to be careful around anecdotal stories because everyone has an anecdote and all the anecdotes can point, to dif- point in different directions. So that's why, that's why we like to rely on statistics and research, not anecdotes. But I have some anecdotes of my own, given that I was a woman in tech for, for a while. Personally, I found it extremely hard to get any kind of programming callbacks after I graduated from university. Um, with a degree in cognitive systems from, it was from the computer science department specializing in AI. Um, I didn't really get any callbacks for programming. And the job I did get hired for in the end was a, a tech support job. And I was hired with the understanding that I would be doing programming work as well. And there would be opportunities to move towards a, more of a programming role. But the person who was going to mentor me in the programming role uh, left the company soon after and I ended up uh, staying in the tech support role. All the, uh, everyone doing tech support and QA was female. Everyone doing programming was male. And and it was definitely a situation where, from a certain perspective, I was overqualified to be doing tech support. But from another perspective, that was also, it was the job I was doing, and there was different ways to interpret it. You can interpret it being my own fault because I wasn't assertive enough to, <clears throat> I wasn't assertive enough to push towards doing more programming. But, and I definitely like looking back, I, I regret that quite a bit because, um, after doing that job, it, it made it even harder for me to move into programming in a way. But from another perspective, there was definitely an element of uh, like people did not look at me and see me as someone who could be a programmer. It was it was not it, it was it was a there was a set of expectations surrounding the role of programmer, and those expectations were very gender based. Do you think that you had mentioned earlier that a lot of the reason why women who are uh, who have a high aptitude for math and programming and sort of techie things also have high aptitudes for other things. And so I wonder if maybe you were just better than everybody else at tech support. And <laughs> that's why you kind of gravitated towards that, that role. I mean, maybe, maybe men who are programmers are just really bad at tech support and that's why they don't do tech support. <laughs> oh, there's definitely an element of that. Like in a lot of, in a lot of employers consciously will say that, they will say, we, we prefer to have women in tech support roles because women have better people skills. And so we like to have, you can look at like the, like the, middle, of the, bill, like the middle of the bell curve, maybe the monkey that both likes the truck and likes the doll. Like they want to have a woman who has some level of tech skills and who's good with people and she'll be good with the customers and the customers like talking to a woman because women have more empathy and all these things. But the reality is the job of uh, tech support, it's, it pays one third the job of programmer and it's far less cognitively demanding, far, far less. And I mean, <laughs> maybe, yeah, I mean, I don't, it's, it doesn't work out so well for the woman, but that is how a lot of employers see it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I think a lot of jobs like that, that, that women gravitate towards tend to be the kind of job where performance isn't necessarily rewarded. 
And that's actually um, one of the reasons why I majored in engineering in college, because I was like, I want to, I want to go into a career where I'm judged on my merit and not, um, you know, on politics, essentially, you know. And so programming is one of those things where, you know, if you're, if you're in an organization with a bunch of programmers, you know who the good programmers are, uh, you know, and those people are paid more and, and more highly valued. Whereas in tech support or, or um, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, yeah, sort of more people facing jobs. When you do a really, really good job, you're not necessarily rewarded for that. And, um, I, I don't know why that is. I, I maybe they're, the metrics just aren't as good for, you know, did you, you know, maybe, maybe they could do, maybe they're, I know companies like to have like, Oh, you know, stay on this call and, you know, give us a five star rating, you know, if you had a good experience or something like that. And maybe that could be a metric for, did, did that person do a good job? But I don't know. I, I don't think you necessarily have to be good at that job to not get fired. So, well, tech support, so tech support's also, a simpler, tech support's a simpler job it, and it's an easier job and more people can do it. Like I could have done. Sorry, I took a little bit of an issue with you saying that like the jobs that women gravitate towards. Sorry. <laughs> I, well, I, I, for whatever reason, you know, like maybe it's cultural, maybe it's, maybe it's natural, but, but there, there seems to be certain jobs that women uh, dominate and certain jobs that men dominate and certain other jobs that are about you know, about balance. I mean, I mean in, the, in the case of my story, I don't really feel that I gravitated towards tech support. Like, I don't think I got a bachelor of science degree and wants to be a tech support technician. Right. I, I, I'm not saying that you intended to gravitate towards it, but you did gravitate towards it. Gravitate, well, okay. I'm just saying. You're, you're, you're saying, saying, you're saying, you're saying gravitate, gravitate, but her no, story is a story where she was trying to go into programming jobs and was pushed yeah. into a tech support role. But Chris, and Chris is trying to say that you end up there, and not that you, you're like, I want to yeah. go over yeah, here. Exactly. But just, I, that's Gravity right. has nothing to do with, with intent, okay? Like, I, I, what I'm saying is you're just getting pulled towards it, you know, reg regardless of what your intent is. Okay. I just wanted to make that distinction like, that that language seems to imply something else. I would read that language in a different way without yeah, usually the word gravitate implies, like, a preference or intentionality. Yeah, that I'm not at all talking about intent. I'm just I, talking about the results. I'm talking about, like, let's just look at where people have ended up. You know, I guess I should say ended up instead yeah. of gravitate towards. There's some research to show that when women enter a highly paid field, the pay level and the prestige tends to decrease. Like in the case of veterinarians, when that went from being a majority male job to a majority female job, the, the pay went down a lot. Also, microbiologists, same thing happened. Also, initially when programming came to be programming was often seen as kind of like a lower paid, low skilled job because computers were very simple at that time. And there were a lot of women in that role. And then later as it more, became more complex, it became a prestigious male job. I, I, there, there, there also may be a factor of if a lot of women start joining a particular field, then it becomes valued less by the marketplace. Yeah, that's partly about supply and demand when the supply of candidates increases, then the rewards for that are going to be less. I don't. It know may not just be facts. about supply. Yeah. It could. Yeah. It could also be that that uh, employers value women's work monetarily less, and view women as less competent, and and so give them less money, and that you know, if if a woman's trying to enter a role that's prestigious it's difficult for her to break in. And then if a, if a bunch of women do enter in and become successful in that role, then that role becomes less prestigious and is paid less. Maybe. Well, that, that's, that's one interpretation of what's going on. But also, employers have to follow the laws of supply and demand. Otherwise, they'll be punished by the market. If you're discriminating against women and paying them less than they deserve, then your competitors are going to hire them at the price that they deserve. And that's going to hurt you. You're assuming that people get yeah. paid what they deserve and that what a person deserves is a, is a fact and, and isn't based heavily on, on people's biases and their, their own personal value. Like why is a yeah, celebrity funny. musician 
why is one celebrity musician paid a lot more than another? Like a lot, of, a lot of where demand comes from is kind of socio-cultural too. Sure. We're, we're not talking about there's, objective there's, there's value. A, there's definitely a cultural component of demand for sure. And yeah, I guess that's kind of where the, the pressure for change can be applied. Right. This might this might be a good a good time to bring up. So there's there's been a few studies. Um, a lot of them are focused on um, academic hiring in STEM positions, but there's been quite a few studies where they've taken identical resumes, we created one version with a male name on top, one version with a female name on top, and sent them out to different employers, and they find significant preference for the male applicant. And instead, in, across the board so it does it does it does suggest there's some level of, of discrimination happening unless you were to contest the study or its methodology in some way yes uh, for an exec for a specific example there was a study uh where it, it was for a scientific research position there were resumes there was identical resumes with male names versus female names Females were rated significantly lower in competence, higher ability, and whether the scientists would be willing to mentor that student. And when the scientists were asked to offer a starting salary, the, they offered uh, lower starting salaries to the female ap applicants, 26,507 compared to 30,238 on average. Yeah, that's, so that, that's, I mean, that, that's just one example. There have been a lot of examples of this. There was a study of grant applicants in the health sciences field. And when the grants were evaluated based on the potential of the researcher, equally qualified researchers were 1.4 times more likely to get funded if they had male names versus if they were female names. Yeah, so, so these studies certainly seem to indicate that, uh, I guess these were in scientific fields, right? So, yeah. and, and well, and, and maybe just employers in general, I'm not sure. Uh, but these yeah. Were, these were in scientific fields. One was uh, scientific academic researchers talking about hiring a, a research assistant. And then the other was for health sciences grants to get funded. Right. So, so these definitely seem to indicate that uh, on average, people are biased against women uh, or, or employers in, and, and scientists who are, um, who are looking at these applications are, are biased against women. And I wonder if, I mean, when, whenever I see whenever I see this kind of biased behavior, I have to wonder where it came from because, yeah, that 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 just seems irrational. Like if <laughs> if if basically you know if basically women can get can can do the same work for the for the same uh, for for much less pay than a man, then why aren't why aren't employ, employers and scientists like really really biased towards women? Um, so, so th there's got to be something else going on. Well, it could right. be like, like a gender bias that... against women. <laughs> <laughs> they could be like. Oh, but the, what I'm saying is that's just, irrational, that's just an irrational. That's just an irrational choice. Why? Yeah. Why, 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 why would you assume that people make rational choices all the time? That this was a, a major assumption of economics, but basically every time it's looked at, people do not make rational choices. Well, it depends on what you mean by rational. But that's a I mean, totally people different, totally different uh, rational financial choices like culture plays a huge role, and that there's a lot of biases that people have in their minds. That's a whole different topic. But I think I want to see a showdown, Katie versus Chris, on <laughs> whether people are rational. Uh, all right, let's do this. It's time for a showdown. So we're gonna have a showdown between Chris and Katie about whether or not humans are rational, self-interested economic actors. A showdown is a five-minute mini-debate. At the end of the showdown, you, the audience, can decide who won. Okay, five, four, three, two, one. You have five minutes. Uh, I'll, I'll go first. So fundamentally, my position is that people are not rational economic actors. You, you brought up this choice of, hmm, it seems that there's this bias where... They could pay women less. They're offering women less money. And if women could do the same job for less money, then why wouldn't everybody just hire tons of women? That seems irrational. And I'm saying that you're making an assumption that people are rational, quote unquote, economic actors and make the best financial 
decisions for themselves. And I, I don't believe that to be the case. And, and also it, there doesn't seem to be a, a lot of evidence that that's the case. I, for one, we can just look at some, some really basic facts of human nature about how, how people value things. There, there's a lot of like conspicuous consumption, designer clothing, th things that are completely irrational. Art is completely irrational. Celebrity is completely irrational, but these things are valued. Why do you say conspicuous consumption is irrational? Well, I'm saying that it's not economically. You really think it has no benefit? No, I, I think it has benefit. I think it has benefit, but I, I think that if you were to analyze it in a pure numbers way, like why would you buy a purse of equal quality where one is $5,000 and the other is $2,000 just for a name? That seems irrational in the same sense that hiring right. a man over hiring a woman is irrational when you could pay the woman less. Right, but clearly there's some benefit that you're not accounting for. Otherwise, you're right. Why would anybody do that? Right, and what and, I'm saying- but, but, but we see it all over the place. We see this type of behavior all over the place. And so, okay, so, so, so backing up, my position is that uh, all decisions are rational. Um, and what I mean by that is that so rationality is subjective. You can look at somebody and say, oh, that person's acting irrational. Uh, but you don't know what that person's goals are. You don't know what that person is trying to achieve. And so how can you say that their behavior is irrational? It might look irrational because, because you think that they're trying to achieve some goal that they're not trying to achieve. And, and I, would, I would assert that, or in my experience, every time I've tried to understand somebody's motivations, I've been able to understand why they took the actions that they took, even though initially I thought that their, their actions appeared irrational. Well, so that, being able to understand somebody's motivations doesn't mean that so they're in the case, irrational. Say that again? The fact that you're able to understand somebody's motivations doesn't mean that the motivations are rational or logical. They, they can be understandable. They don't have to be a mystery to be irrational. That's not what rationality means. But, so so what, do you, what do you mean that motivations can be irrational? You, you said every time I thought that somebody was being irrational, I looked into it and then I was able to understand their motivations. And I was saying that just because you can understand somebody's motivations doesn't mean that they're being rational. You can be irrational and not a mystery. Well, you, you could have I mean, irrational I mean, motivations. What you're saying, like you what you're saying have, is your motivations are wrong to that person. No, I'm saying your motivations are illogical. That's what you're saying. Yeah, <laughs> that's the same thing. You're that's saying, not, why would you have those motivations? And well, you're not that person. So how do you know? Okay. I, I mean, one, something being illogical doesn't mean that it's wrong. It could be emotional. E emotions are rational. Emotions are telling you useful information. Emotions are often telling you useful information and are sometimes telling you information that's steering you off course because your emotions are, are evolutionary, evolutionarily geared to a different world. The emotions aren't always rational. And also we, we, we draw a distinction between somebody who's acting rationally and somebody who's acting. I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that you should always do what your emotions are telling you. That's, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is they're always telling you useful information. So it's, it's rational to factor in how you're feeling for sure. Okay. I, I agree. It's rational to factor in how you're feeling. But here, here, let me give you some like concrete examples of how people are often irrational. Like when they're using logic, the logic is often flawed. We can take into example uh, the that there's there's a a com phenomenon that's known as uh, what's it what's the best term for this? Basically, the signs of availability, where basically the more you are able to think of examples of something that are occurring, you're more likely to believe that it's more frequent. So, like if if there's a news story that comes out about a mass shooting people will believe that more and more mass shootings are happening, even if they're aware that you can look at the statistics and mass shootings have been going down over the years, for example. Mass shootings are going up, but that if you're talking about murder bias. rates, huh? That confirmation bias? You could call it confirmation. Confirmation bias is, is more, that, that's it's slightly more like different. recent bias. Yeah. It's, it's more like it's, what bias? 
This is the out of time, out of time. Also, Kurt, you're not supposed to be talking. It's a debate. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, was a little bit rough. I was not prepared for that debate, to be real. Like, There's like a bunch of weird cognitive biases that people have, like anchoring effects and like. Right. Yeah. Yes. Right. And, and yes. all that I'm saying is so, you, you, use, you use the information that you have and your life experience to choose the best course of action that's available to you. You know, maybe, maybe on retrospect, it, it, that wasn't helping you achieve your goals. But, but every time people make a decision, it's because they, they think that's the best decision. So in that sense, all decisions are rational. Well, no, because that, that's a really dumb sense to say that, that that's what rationality is, though. I mean, you well, just invoke otherwise, confirmation, otherwise you have confirmation to... bias. Confirmation bias is an example of people acting irrationally. I think you've created a definition of rationality that encompasses all decisions where people think they're making the right decision at the time. Well, because and, that's, and that's, that's not a useful highest, definition. That's the higher standard of rationality that there is. Well, the uh, no, it's not. That's not how people define rationality. That's the only way that the only way the definition no, of rationality could be higher is if you impose some kind of objective standard as to what's rational, and then you have to then you have to come up with some some objective goal, which is you know the the objectively good motivation for doing things, and then you have to judge people based on that. But you yeah, know, rational, you rationality isn't rationality isn't identical with objective good. Rationality just means that there's a clear chain of reasoning. Yeah. It's the quality based usually, on clear thought and, and, and reason. Pretty much there always is. Based on clear thought so and Chris, reason. So Chris is using this uh, Austrian economics definition of rationality and so like saying Wait, that the motivations. Yeah, it's from, uh, isn't it from human action? I think that's where it first started. Maybe, it's just, a, it's just a, it's a belief that I have that's based on my, my uh, sort of skepticism about objective reality. Yeah. If, if I'm yeah, if I'm on a yeah, diet if I'm on a diet if I'm on a diet action. and I want to lose ten pounds and I like see a Mars bar and I become overcome by a desire for sugar and I buy it and eat it and regret it that was not a rational decision. Well, if you no, regret it, it again, if you regret it later, yeah. then you can say, "Oh, that was an irrational decision." But in the exactly. moment, exactly. Okay, so you're, you're going. My benefit, is, economic is, decisions my benefit from this is going to be worth the cost. Okay, and that's what I mean. You're you're okay. sitting here feeling. You don't make yes. decisions based on logic and rationality you're taking into how you feel taking into account how you feel about everything and you're going and when you make that decision you're going the the, the benefit to making this decision is going to outweigh the cost and therefore i'm going you to just said you don't make decisions based on logic and rationality that's the debate you just you just you just agreed with me so i think we're done. <laughs> Right. <laughs> okay, yeah, I think we're saying the same thing. I think maybe we're just you don't make decisions based that people on. don't make decisions based on logic and rationality. Well, because you can't. You, there, there's no right, such right. Thing so that's what that's what it means. Yeah. No such thing as making a decision on or logic irrational. Or yes, there's no people that is are a, not that is always chimera. rational. That is a chimera. That is something that does not exist. There is no such thing as making a decision logically and rationally. Okay, emotions always are taken into account. Always. You just said emotions are often rational. Look, look, emotions like, look, are like, always rational. Emotions are always giving you useful this, information. There's, there's, a part, there's, there's, so. there's the part of me that ultimately decides, right? Like there's the emotions I'm having. There's the base desires. There's this rational decision-making process. There's maybe a rationalization process of just making excuses for the base desires and they're right. all happening inside. Right. And ultimately there is a part that is deciding. And either the part that is deciding is being controlled by, the, by being pulled left and right by my base desires or I'm able to like exert some kind of rational decision making where I'm coordinating all that stuff that's happening within me and coming to a rational decision. It can be rational or it can be irrational. So I, 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 I disagree Chris's that there's a difference between those two things. Yeah. So, so, okay, I wanna, I wanna bring this back a little bit to the, the topic at hand. We were talking about people making hiring decisions about men and women and Chris was saying that it seems irrational that people wouldn't hire women if they could pay them less. And I, yes. I agree. That is irrational. Yeah, and what I'm saying is that as soon as somebody, some large corporation just goes, oh, we can get all the women for super cheap, then that, per that player is going to dominate, okay? But why haven't we seen that? Yeah. Because, because maybe it, that's I not think true. One reason, no, I think, well, maybe it's not true. I think one reason is the fact that all, all these organizations are basically set up for men. They've been, there's this long inheritance of the, the way that things are set up and so it makes sense to hire men because you know men are going to fit more in culturally if you had organizations that were set up for women or set up for men and women 
then we might see something that's very different. And it's, there's a, there's a pervasive, if there is a pervasive social bias against women, which to some extent there, there likely is, but let's say there's a pervasive bias towards seeing men as more authoritative. Then if you have like a male candidate come in and a female candidate, you might say like, well, the male candidate was more authoritative. And that might be just based on the fact that he was a man, not based on how, how the men and women act. Like there's evidence that when a woman comes in and is like acting like really like in a more masculine way, she's perceived negatively as well. So it, it could be that there's that bias, but in a way that's not necessarily even irrational if you have that bias, because it could be that everybody else in the industry is going to have that bias. So if you have that man on your side, then it's good for your company because the, if the bias is culture is, is culture wide, then having that guy instead of that woman, even if they're otherwise equally qualified, gives you a candidate that is perceived by everyone else as being more authoritative. Right. And, and so what I'm saying is that if, the, if it's true what you are saying, that this is a, an irrational choice that all companies in the industry are making, then as soon as one company decides to do the rational thing and hire all of the women, that company is going to dominate. Because again, the women cost less than men. So if they're doing exactly the same job and they have exactly the same risk profile, then c companies that do that are going to start dominating because their costs are going to be lower and their, their performance is going to be the same. But okay, what Ariel just said is that is that it, a, a lot of business has to do with sales and relationships and respect between businesses and respect from your customers. And if women are less respected as professionals, then if you're hiring women, even if they're equally competent, if everyone around you is perceiving them as incompetent, then your business being mostly female is going to disadvantage your business in every single negotiation it has. All right. So the, yeah, it's like you can't, take things in a vacuum, you have to look at the whole context of how they fit in. Yeah. I, I, can you, sorry, can you make that point again? I just, I didn't quite understand what you were saying. A lot of the success of a business isn't just about how competent the employees are at, at doing their programming job or at their business development or, or, or whatever. It's also about connections and part of doing business is you, you have to gain the respect of your customers. You have to gain the respect of outside okay, collaborators. So saying, companies that, that hire men a lot of times have the advantage because men are seen as more authoritative or they have some kind of, um, women have some kind of visibility issue where they, they, actually, they actually are just as good as the men, but the men are seen as better um, and so companies that hire men uh, actually perform better. And so it is rational for companies to do that. I, I'm saying it, it wouldn't, the, the company wouldn't necessarily just dominate. The company wouldn't necessarily just dominate. And I, I don't want to make claims right now about whether women on average would be just as good in all of these jobs or, or whether there are just as many women who want to do tech jobs or whatever. But the, the fact is, is that even if a woman is just as qualified, she's perceived as less qualified. And that in and of itself, there's a lot of things that can go into that. Okay, so there's like the, the phenomenon of the Pygmalion effect where if, if other people's expectations of you are lower, then you'll perform worse than, than if your expectations were higher. There's also the, the phenomenon of stereotype threat where like people are likely to conform to stereotypes about their own group. And then there's, even if that's not hitting you, if people have negative stereotypes about you, then they're less likely to want to engage with you and you're have, gonna have just a harder time getting anywhere. So like, even if your raw ability is the same, there's a million things that are gonna knock you down if people perceive you as being less competent. Yeah, and, and I definitely was thinking about this when we were doing the reading, like it, it does seem like there, there's certainly a, um, this, this leftover bias that, um, that, that was culturally constructed, um, but, the, but the, the structures uh, that we inherited from these earlier ages are, are outdated now. Um, and, but, but those structures are still being reinforced because of the effects that you, that you talk about. And so, it, it, but it does seem, I mean, I was thinking about, you know, well, well, there's never been a woman president of the United States. And so uh, women are probably not on average thinking about, oh, I'm going to be president of the United States as much as men are. Um, and that's unfortunate 
because I'm sure, you know, that women uh, would do just as good of a job. Yeah. Yeah. Young girls tend to think about it just as much as young boys, but once you get into adolescence then they don't think about it as much anymore. But there's no way to fix that uh, other than applying this equity doctrine, right? Uh, Like actually making, actually making the incidence of these things equal so that, that, that picture um, of there, there would be, there would be no way to, so people have these unconscious associations because because they see that certain fields are dominated by men and certain fields are dominated by women. And so you get this unconscious association in your mind between, you know, this, this, you know, male and career and, and family and, and women or something like that. And that's really hard to break unless the, unless the actual numbers in the society reflect an equity. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a cyclical effect. Yeah. Um, applying that equity is really difficult. Yeah. The, the equity policy is tough. Another thing it's worth noting is that, um, if there is a level of discrimination, it compounds as you move up the hierarchy. Let's say there's a 10%, dis- let's say there's 10% discrimination for each job. It means for the first job, the man is at 100, the woman's at 90. For the second job, the man is at 100, the woman's at 81. For the third job, the man is at 100, the woman is at, uh, I don't know, like 73. Do you understand? Because each for each job, you have to, it becomes compounded, like it becomes it grows exponentially. The amount like, like work history, like, like as your life progresses, like your first job, you have this much discrimination and then. Well, it'd be, it's because if the, if the man has 10 opportunities for every nine that the woman has uh, for the first job, it means that th- like those opportunities compound and create new opportunities. Right. Exactly. Right. So, so it means you're talking that when about like, second like level, the man will have 10 opportunities for every 8.1 that the woman has. Right. So what, once you get to, once you get to the 10th rung of the ladder, then you're at the the man is at 100 and the woman is at 35. Right. Yeah, because you see, like, like we're multiplying like the discrimination quotient quotient by each um basically by each opportunity. So by right. the, by the tenth opportunity, because it's like if I don't if 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 there's you know if I don't get the entry level job I'm looking for right after right out of university, I'm not going to get the intermediate level job that's after the entry level job. Right. Exactly. And this is. Uh, what they talk about with, with the concept of privilege as well. People yeah. are like, well, yeah, yeah, you had all these opportunities and you don't even realize that you had these opportunities because everybody else was missing them while you were getting them. It, it's probably even worse than that too because it's not just, uh, it's if you get the lower opportunity job, then the opportunities that are available to you are worse opportunities and then you're, you're still facing bias again to get to the next stage. It's, it would be difficult to try to ca- calculate it out, but yeah, yeah it's tough. You you were kind of pointing at these implicit biases and implicit associations that can build up when when you see different results over time. You can you can end up with an unconscious bias or unconsciously associating men with certain careers, women with certain careers, women with babies, men with more go getterness or whatever. We actually took implicit association tests prior to this episode. And I think the results were kind of interesting. Do you want to go around and, and share what, what we got? Do you want to say yours first? <laughs> sure. Okay. <laughs> sure. So mine was bad. Um, so d- just to clarify, what we did is we, we took a test bad. that uh, it's an online test. And basically what it does is it, it puts different words next to each other. Some are basically words that are career oriented words some are family oriented words and it's basically having you do like a a word association thing with male and career or female and career or male and family and female and family and measuring how long it, it takes you to make those associations and how many mistakes that you that you make essentially and uh you they they train you by like first showing you these words correlated in in one way and having you do it one way first and then the other way, like trying to associate male with career and female and family. And then you try to associate female and career and male and family or the other way around. When I took the test, I got the male and career and female and family association first. And there there is supposed to be a a small effect of which one you do first does change your results a little bit because you kind of train your mind to associate that one those ones but uh yeah i actually i got a strong 
association between male and career and female and family. I got the the highest possible level of association. Yeah, I, I had a moderate. Yeah. yeah. I had a moderate association between male and career and fem female and family, but it was weird because the, the test claims to be random, but every one of us that took the test, it showed the association between male and career first. And they could, they're claiming that it's a, a small impact. Uh, I don't think it's a small impact because it's basically like, this is the first time you're doing this. You're going to get trained to, associate male and career and then we tell you that you're associating male and career so i don't i don't buy this <laughs> right i mean that's that's that was exactly my experience i i got male and career first and so you're sitting there you know trying to react as fast as you can with either your left hand or your right hand and so you know they have the the, the male and career words over here and they have the female and family words over here and you're like all right cool at, at first you're kind of slow but then you're like all right i got the hang of this and then and then they and then they reverse it on you and they have you know female and career over here or female and career over here and they have male and family over here and then you're sitting there and you've got this muscle memory that you've just trained right and so you're sitting there having to counteract that so of course you're going to take longer to answer the questions and I, of course you're going to get some of them wrong <laughs> i did take the test again and i got female and career and male and family first and i still got a moderately strong association between male and career and female and family right okay. because the first one that you do no, I, 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 no I, I took it. I took it a week later, and or almost a week later, and got female and career and male and family first. And muscle still, memory lasts longer than a week. For doing something like that once, I, I don't think it would be that strong. Yeah, the and the I, the IIT. Um, what is it? Like seventy five percent associate male and career, twenty five percent associate female and family. Either strong, strongly or moderately, I believe, and. They claim that it's it's random, so a lot of those. So, so you'd expect if it was random and the only effect happening was that latency effect, then it would be fifty fifty. It's not. Yeah, but I, I question, as Kurt said, I question whether it's random because, as we as we noted, there were five of us that we know, the four of us and one of Kurt's friends, I think, that took the test, and we all got that male and career training <laughs> before we got the female and career training. And so I think that that yeah, heavily biases crazy. you. That's crazy. That's still a, there's still a 2.5% chance that's a, that happening. That's a yeah, one out of 32 chance that that will happen. Wait, didn't, didn't Katie have, have female and career first one time? Yeah, I did. So, I mean, so we could say, so it was, it was six, six tests and I got it. Uh, I got female and career and male and family first. That yeah, but that doesn't, the, the first time you take the test is the test that matters because that's the one where you, where you haven't had the test before. And so you, 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 you can't possibly have been biased by the test. No, but I'm, I'm saying like, I, if we're just, if you're trying to claim that the creators of the tests are lying about the back end of it and it's not actually random, I, I did get it the other way around. I mean, there's a, there's a one in 32 again, if it's, if it's actually 50-50 and the first test that you receive has a 50% chance of being female in career, then we should have seen that much, we should have seen that 16 out of 32 times rather than one out of 32 times. I did get it the other way around once. We would have to do, the, yeah. we would have, so the stats possible. are a little bit more complex. We took, we took six tests and we got one that was the other way around. I mean, like yeah. we could make a conspiracy about it, but also this online test isn't the only version of this test and it's been demonstrated a lot a lot of times by a lot of different implicit association tests. Yeah, well, so- yeah, so, but Chris, if, Chris, if you really believe that there's a conspiracy and that they're lying about how random it is, it would be, this would be a really big story to break. So you could like, and it would be really easy to break it too. You just need to design some kind of machine like an IP scrambler and just do like, a, ten, have it do the tests like, <laughs> or in, even in, not really do the test, just initiate the test like 10,000 times and then see if it's actually like 90% doing the male career association. But if, that, if you that really actually does sound rigged, like fun. If you really think, yeah. if you really think it's rigged, you should do it because that would be a major story. Yeah. I'd like, that, what I'm saying is I have yet to talk to anybody that. whose first time <laughs> they took the test, they got female in career. Okay, yeah. but, okay, but you understand things that have a likelihood of like um, one in 32 happen pretty frequently in the world. They happen one out of 32 times, actually. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> 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 what I'm saying is one out of 32 is a very, very low probability. And what I'm saying is I'm skeptical. I'm not saying, oh, you know, it's impossible that it's random. But what I'm saying is I'm skeptical. Okay. But regardless, yeah. that 
this isn't the only IAT that there is. And, and the other thing I mean, is if that- If you think all of them are rigged, then okay. The other thing to note is that even- I think we should operate yeah. under the assumption that they're not for the purposes of this conversation. Otherwise that's like- Okay, so, so uh, uh, accepting that, that that's, that's, that's true, accepting that it's actually random and we all just got, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, mail. Yeah, we, we, what I'm saying is, so uh, with a large sample, with a large enough sample, if you, if you give, you know, this many people male and career first and this many people female and career first, then taking, you know, statistics, you're going to get, you know, you, you might see, still see some bias reflected. And actually, I'm, I'm certain that there is bias because of, um, because as I was mentioning earlier, the, 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 the material uh, conditions of, of our society are such that men, uh, there's a higher incidence of men in, uh, you know, high paying, you know, careers. Uh, and, and so, and so when you live your entire life like that, of course that bias gets built into you and, and, you know, and you start to associate those things together. But what I'm saying is, so, but, but so even given that, but on a, on an anecdotal level, on a personal level, the test is not just telling you, okay, you know, here, here are the, here, it doesn't give you a, like a report of the people with your demographic and how you compared with those people. It just tells you you're biased. That's all it says. It basically says like, you're a bigot, <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't say that, you know, but that's, that's the implication. It, and so, it, it so, does, so it doesn't say you're a bigot and it does at the end also break down the percentage of people who, who got in each rung of, of bias. Right. But it doesn't, it doesn't tell you how likely like you, I mean, you have to answer all these demographic questions at the beginning. You have to tell them what your gender is and you have to tell them, you know, what your, what your location is and your, your ed education level and all this. And it, it would be really interesting to, to see, to see that data and how you stack up. And, um, and Chris, that data does exist. Like, it's just, you just have to read their papers. Okay. Maybe I'll go do that. So. I think I, I did take it the other way around. I still got a moderate bias. And I know, Chris, you might say that my muscle memory was still from last week, but I, I, I could feel that my muscle memory was, was working against me the second time that I took there, not working against me, but my, my muscle yeah, memory exactly. was working. No, no. I mean, my muscle work memory was working towards female career, male family the second time I took that test because I had just done it that way. I, I could feel that. But I still got them. But you, but you still got, yeah, still got a bias. Like that's yeah. okay. That's. I mean, do you feel like you actually uh, caused the test to to give you a a, a female and career result rather than the, the result you got? What do you mean? Like, do you uh, feel that the the <laughs> do you feel that the result that you received was correct based on how you took the test? Yeah. Um, basically, I feel that I, I felt that both times that I took the test, the way that I had the association working first, like skewed it a little bit, but also both times that I took the test, I did generally, <laughs> genuinely feel a, a more difficulty and more of a lag when I was trying to associate female and career and male and family. Okay. Yeah. And to me, that wasn't surprising like i i know that i do have that bias yeah yeah and and i think the test is you know for all of its flaws yeah it probably it doesn't seem surprising at all that people would be biased towards that 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 men are associated with career and women are associated with family you said something like the test basically just tells you that you're a bigot I don't feel that bias equals big, bigotry. Do you then what does it take really? to make a bigot? That's an interesting... Like, does it take action or... Like, uh, active hate or something like that? Active discrimination? Yeah, hmm. uh, I think it takes action. I think it takes... Well, there, there's a lot of different factors. and But I think that action... Uh, hatred, actual negative feelings. And also I think that an another difference would be if you have the bias and are aware of the bias, are you trying to compensate for that bias or is your attitude about it? Well, yeah, 
fuck women, they should be at home. <laughs> I mean, you should think about it and be like, is it actually riskier for me to hire women uh, or not? And, and I think often it is riskier to hire women, especially, yeah, in, in jobs that require, you know, long hours and long months of work without, you know, without missing a whole lot of time. If, if a woman becomes pregnant, then I think that's part of the calculus. It's like, oh, there's a risk that she might just not be here for, be here for a while. I actually have an anecdote about that. Um, I was once uh, observing a hiring committee at a university. Uh, I was allowed to sit in in a kind of weird way. And it, the committee actually did take that into account. They were evaluating a male candidate and a female candidate. Uh, they were both very qualified for the job. When the female candidate came up, the head of the committee said something like, she's moving to a new city. Why is that? Was there a boyfriend issue? She's in her early 30s. She may want to have kids soon. How is this going to affect her performance at the job? And this is all being taken into account, even though the male candidate was the same age, same similar circumstances. So that that is something that, is something that employers often do consciously take into account, or at least it, it happens. So right, in, and I'm saying that, that that's States, rational. In the United States, it's illegal for them to take that into account. However, I'm, I'm sure they still do. And Would you say that's irrational? I wouldn't say it's irrational, no. I, I, mean, I think that you should try to judge people as individuals, and I don't think it's irrational to take that into account. However, do I think that it's a good thing for people to take it into account? Do I think maybe it would make sense for us to be a little bit irrational for the sake of equality in this? Oh gosh, I'm almost it's regretting. Really, I'm almost regretting it good for us to be irrational? It's, it's really, it's really dicey, but I, I, it, it, it is a little bit different because of the the physical reality of pregnancy and and breastfeeding it motherhood and fatherhood are are different <laughs> and and i mean it, it depends what level you're looking at it at it from right like if you're looking at the short term interests of the company maybe there is a rationality to it although i would argue there could be it could be one of those things where that kind of attitude can backfire on a company in a very big way yeah absolutely but but i'd say as a civilization it's it's a very dangerous and it's a very dangerous to focus. I would say as a civilization, the rational thing is to encourage people not to focus on that in hiring, which is what we do, like making it an illegal hiring practice and stuff like that. Well, a, a court, uh, apparently um, some, I think it's like Denmark, some Scandinavian countries actually pay men to not work when they, you know, when, they're, when their wife has a kid. Um, and basically what that does when is they it- have a kid. Even, When they have a kid, yeah. Yeah, when they have a kid. Yeah, exactly. And, and, <laughs> well, I guess I'm just being really literal. Okay. Um, but basically what that does is it evens out the risk calculus because if the, if the woman and if, if, a, if a new parent is going to take off the same amount of work, uh, regardless of whether they're male or female, then the risk calculus is the same. And so it, 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 that, that gets rid of it. It, it, it. It's no longer rational to hire a man versus a woman. So, so in, right. in that situation, I would say if there is still uh, sort of this pay gap that we see, um, then I, yeah, I, I would say that, that you can attribute that mostly to bias. Unless you find that in actuality, men tend to actually take off less time, which I don't know what the research, what the stats for that is. You might have to pay the men more. <laughs> to so incentivize men, them to men on average do tend to work more hours and even when they work at the same jobs there was a there was a case i think it was for for train train operators or something like that a while ago where they were looking and saying wow like men and women in this specific field in the exact same job are getting paid significantly less but then when they looked at it a little bit they they realized that men were taking like five times the amount of overtime as the women were i it, it is true men work more hours on average when they're working full time. But then there's also the question of why is that happening? You know, one thing that you said earlier in the conversation, Ariel, is yeah, we see these differences, we observe these differences, but why is that happening? Is it natural? Is it that women want to take more time with their children? Is it that they're pressured into it? Is it that society expects them to? Is it that fatherhood isn't seen as as important 
as motherhood is. It's really hard to parse those things out. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Yeah. I mean, socially, it does seem like people expect mothers to be responsible for the children in a way that people don't expect fathers to. This is, again, another anecdote, and I know we don't like anecdotes, but I do like anecdotes when they're used in conjunction with statistics. I was in some kind of an online community, and people were talking about the the two parent working household and one commenter had said something like, you know, we, we want to say that it's okay for women to go to work and that it doesn't negatively affect the children. But the fact of the matter is, is that because my mom went to work, I was put in daycare as a child. I was left alone. I feel like my emotional development was stunted in a lot of ways. And every, he got a lot of likes on this. He had some people disagreeing and saying, you know, you can, you can have a healthy childhood, even if both parents are working. But nobody, until I came on, and this was like 40, 50 commenters later, said anything like, why do you say that when there's two parents working, because your mom went to work, you were emotionally stunted? You're saying it's the mom's responsibility for, you to, for her to emotionally care for you, and you're just assuming that the dad would be working. We're not putting any responsibility on the dad for your emotional growth whatsoever. That'd be an interesting that would be another like rabbit hole we could go down. Like, is that an equal responsibility? Because women are kind of associated with emotions and it's men an, are kind of less. I kind of would be interested in going down the rabbit hole. One thing I want to add to this conversation, which I think is really important, is um, the biggest gender bias in hiring that they found is uh, with mothers and fathers. Because when you have uh, single childless people, uh, the gender bias is there, but it's, it's smaller. But when you introduce, when they send out resumes, like the same study, when they send out resumes, one with a male name, one with a female name, they're all the same. But they have something on the resume indicating the person's a parent, like PTA involvement. There's a massive penalty for mothers and there's a small boost for fathers. So mothers, this is again identical resumes. Mothers were offered on average 11,000 less than childless women and 13,000 less than fathers. Yeah. And again, I think a lot of that has to do with, it's not necessarily that they think the women are doing a worse job. I think it has to do with that. They think the women are more of a risk. Yeah, I I agree. More of a risk won't work as hard. There's some level of bias, probably maybe a level of moralizing. Yeah. Well, and I mean, just think about it. It, Anecdotally, there's probably studies on this, I'm sure. But I, I think if we all think to our own childhoods and personal experiences. If you were homesick, like more often than not, it's, it's the mom that takes off work to care for you, right? That, that's, that's usually the default in a two-parent household is, is moms usually handle most of the kid things or child emergencies and, and things like that. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly how it worked in my, in my family. Did you, did you guys have, I guess you don't have to answer if you don't want to, but did you guys have working parents or both parents working or was there a stay at home? My mom stayed at home. My dad worked. We, we also had a four kid family. But, uh, both my parents worked, but my mom worked less. Like my, my dad had more of a career. My, my mom had several jobs over the years. Uh, my my dad worked full time and my mom worked part time flexible hours when I was young and then when I was eight or nine she went back to college and then worked full time. Yeah, my mom did not work when I was a kid. But she had us pretty young, so when she went back to when I was twelve, she went back to work and she was still in her thirties, so it was a re- still a reasonable time for her to launch a career. Not that any age is reasonable to start to launch a career, but Right. If you do it fairly, you know, younger is generally a, a age bias would be another thing that I, I, we didn't do any of the research on this, but age discrimination is a, is a big, <laughs> that's yeah. a big deal as well yeah. in hiring. People have all sorts of different biases for different innate qualities. Yes. That's a big one. Uh, yeah, that, that would be a rabbit hole though. Do you want to go down that? Do you want to go down that rabbit hole? of motherhood versus fatherhood and responsibility? Are women more of a risk? I mean, so I I think you talked about having anecdotes and you talked about having statistics, but I think you also have evolutionary biology. 
So if you look at the history of our, <laughs> of our, our race, um, uh, I guess before agriculture, um, in, in hunter-gatherer societies, the, the, the men were tasked, generally, with uh, like going out and hunting and warring and um, being sort of away from the home and taking care of things and making, making sure that the home was safe, but basically not spending as much time with the kids as the mom. Whereas the, the mom and, and the women in the society were more tasked with uh, like gathering food and uh, staying closer to the house and taking care of the children. So, and, and that's, we were hunter gatherers for a large majority of our history. Um, so it's, it's pretty, I would say it's pretty evident that that is built into our genetic makeup at, at this point. You know, one interesting thing, like, these, are, these, these evolutionary biology stories, or you got to be a little bit careful about them too, because it's easy to come up with like just so stories. Like you can construct a story for anything you want to support in some ways, but it's still, I think there's value in it. Like it constrains some of our explanations. But what, one thing I find interesting, like looking back at the hunter-gatherer thing is there's almost, I think this argument originated with Marx, but there's an argument that like uh, in hunter-gatherer times, if you look at where the food came from, the men were bringing home a lot a lot of the hunting, whereas the women were, were gathering. And so you had both the males and the females bringing in food. And in a lot, in a lot of places, it was differed regionally, but in a lot of places, most of the calories came from gathering. The, the women were bringing home the bulk of, of the food. Mm -hmm. Then you get into agricultural society. And in agricultural societies, it functions very differently. Like for one, one aspect of agricultural societies is you can't have a pregnant woman operate a draft animal because she she'll have like a pregnant woman operating a draft animal has like a one in third chance of miscarriage so it's a very bad idea so you get a situation where basically the men are doing all the farming bringing home all the food and the only role that remains to women is taking care of the children like chris pointed out most of our evolutionary history we were hunter gatherers like a vast majority of it and agriculture is a relatively new technology it changed a lot of things but there's, it's a more complex argument than what I'm making out, but for various reasons in agricultural society, the argument is agricultural society is what led to the inevitability of the subordination of women. Like in hunter-gatherer societies, some of them were very patriarchal, some of them were very egalitarian, whereas in agricultural societies, it's inevitable that women um, take, on a, take on a status that's closer to that of property than what was the case in, in hunter-gatherer societies. And it's interesting because now... We exist in a time where we're not really a primarily agricultural society anymore. Like we still, we still are, like our food still comes from agriculture, but only a very small proportion of the population needs to work in agriculture. So in, in a way, and that's where you see women returning to, to the workforce and women returning to being producers in a really big way that, that didn't really exist since hunter-gatherer times. Yeah, it's a very it, good point. Our work is labor is no longer entirely physical, so these these physical advantages that men have in, in hard labor are, are are no longer so relevant, and it does not seem to be the case that men have big cognitive or any cognitive advantages really. Right. It, it definitely seems that uh, there was this sort of biological division of labor in hunter-gatherer times, which was exacerbated by agriculture, which um, sort of required this separation of labors, where since, yeah, since it was dangerous for pregnant women to, to work in the fields, and uh, uh, they were already sort of tasked with taking care of the children, then that's what they ended up doing. Um, and, and yeah, and then now that we're in this modern era where most people don't need to work in fields and it's absolutely cool for a pregnant woman to, to do just about any, well, knowledge work, maybe not, um, maybe not construction work or something like that, but uh, there, there's a, probably the vast majority of, of jobs out there are not more dangerous for pregnant women to do than just the average person. There's another aspect to this too, though. It's not just can women work and can women be good providers and are women suitable to being providers but there's also the question of the the special relationship between a mother and a baby you know, mothers feed babies from their own bodies there's evidence that 
women react differently to the sound of a baby crying than men do. Their you know, brains light up more. There's, I, I think that there is maybe a, a not maybe, honestly, I, I think there is a special bond and also some practical reasons that if you're going to have a parent stay home to be a child caregiver, at least in the early years, it, it makes some natural sense for it to be the mom. You can have it in reverse. You can have the mom go to work and do like breast milk pumping or use formula. But I think that there's some natural advantages to it being the woman who's, who's the primary caregiver, at least in those early years. And then that momentum probably stays. There's also evidence of a psychic connection between mother and child where the, the milk lets down when the child is hungry. That's actually really interesting. Can you like maybe elaborate a little bit, Kurt? Okay. So it's, yeah, they did, they did some experiments about it where they, they try to tell, uh, I think they, the, the mother would record when her milk let down it's, and when she had a feeling like, Oh, my baby needs me. And at that point, the, the normally accurate. And so there's, there's also, uh, I guess it was based around more anecdotal or t- case studies where you ask women, well, have you ever been say in a supermarket and you felt suddenly that your baby needed you and you called home and your intuition was correct. And of course, m- many, many women have that experience. My, my mom anecdotally has told me that many times <laughs> like, Oh, we just, yeah. I just had ESP. <laughs> Hmm. So maybe, yeah, maybe there's a biological basis for that. My mom has told me some similar things. I'm, I'm so skeptical of things like that, but I don't want to just discount so many people's experience either. But e- even on yeah. like a pure, not speculative, not anecdotal level, the, the content of breast milk changes not only like throughout the course of the baby's development, like with, with different makeup and, you know, different amounts of breast milk being produced, but also the amount and like the fat composition will, will change throughout the day and throughout the feeding. And I I don't know how much has been looked into the advantages of actually breastfeeding as opposed to bottle feeding with breast milk. I know there's lots of advantages of breastfeeding over formula feeding, but it it seems like there, it's not just like you can pump breast milk and then feed it at any time. And it's the same. It seems like there's something about the in the moment connection between the mother and the baby that actually changes. There has to be some kind of rhythm or something like that. Right. Yeah. It, it's a really rough question. Cause like on one hand, like it's, it's really rough cause there really does seem to be a lot of advantages to especially little children of having a parent around. And it does seem like there is like, there is a special relationship with the mother in a way, but it's rough because like, it's hard to see how that wouldn't affect the career. Like I want to say that stuff like daycare in the offices, like it seems like talking about this hunter gatherer thing, like one way to approximate it in modern times could be like having women work in such a way where they're in closer proximity to the children as a gatherer would in primordial times. But it's yeah, it's really well, it, it, tough. It's it's really tough with knowledge work. I mean, one thing that happens when when a woman becomes pregnant is she loses a little bit of her cognitive ability too, which is a thing to keep into in mind. But it comes back after. Oh wow, I, I hadn't heard that. It's a baby That's... brain, yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a friend who has little children, and it's really really tough. Like it's like kind of a constant. It's a constant cognitive load to take care of them, and it seems like especially in the modern world where so much of our work is, is cognitively demanding. It seems like it would be really tough to like, like I know that like I can't write an article if I'm being, if I'm interrupted at all, I get really irritated at people, but I I can't imagine writing a thing where I'm being interrupted every 10 seconds. (laughs) And also your, your level of neuroticism goes up. (laughs) That's that's one of the personality changes that tends to take place like during pregnancy. And when you become a mother, I think you become more tuned to really pay attention to these interruptions because these are like the most important little tiny interruptions in the world. And they're happening constantly all the time. 
maybe like daycare in the workplace. Like maybe if there was a workplace and it had a daycare actually in the workplace. So there was someone watching the children. So you could go do a task and like focus on it, but then you could come back and check in on your children pretty frequently. So it's not like they were, so they didn't feel like, like I know there's studies that children who are in daycare, there's sometimes like um, a sense of abandonment. So it could help alleviate that. Right. And, and hunter gatherer societies had, were like villages, right? Where they, I mean, maybe not all of them, but, you know, small communities where it wasn't necessarily just a household, right, with a man and a woman and some children, and that's it, you know, and, and then the parents leave and go to, go to work and just leave their kids, you know, somewhere. Um, there, there was this kind of community where maybe the grandparents uh, could take over when the parents were busy, or maybe the, you know, the, the, the sisters and the cousins and the, um, the friends, um, you, you know, all of those people could chip in and help raise the kids. Of course, the mother is still the primary caregiver, but if she needs to not be distracted while doing something, she can do that. The, the role of the grandmother and the community mm -hmm. probably predated the role of the father, actually. The role of the grandmother almost certainly did. I, like sure. just, yeah, for a lot of human history, they didn't, they didn't track who the father was so much. I was just going to say, too, being that we're from the U.S., Canada, and Australia – we're actually kind of unique in the world in like this two parent household model. I think in most of the world, people are much more likely to live in multi generational multi generational homes where the grandparents are are there during those early child rearing years, and a lot of times they play a huge role. And I don't think that I, I, I doubt. I, I don't know. I haven't looked into research on it, but I doubt that children feel the same sense of abandonment being cared for by grandma than going to some kind of a daycare institution with 30 kids and two 20-somethings being paid $9 an hour. <laughs> yeah, and that's yeah. another argument in favor of having kids younger, which also can really impact the career. But, like, my parents had me in their 20s, and, like, when I was a little kid, my grandparents were in their 50s and 60s, so they had plenty of energy, and they could have us over for sleepovers and stuff. And they were very involved. And I look at them now in their 80s, like if we were little kids, they wouldn't be able to do very much to take care of us. Yeah. yeah. There are also alternatives too, though, like another, yet another anecdote. But I, I did go to daycare as a child when my mom was working part-time. I didn't feel any kind of sense of abandonment at all. But the daycare that I went to was a small daycare that was run by a mom and it was me and her kids and like two other kids and it was it was very much she was friends of the family and it was a home style environment I didn't mind going over there at all I thought it was awesome yeah 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 and and I wonder if going back to the grandmother thing like I wonder if having somebody be closely biologically related to you uh, is if there are advantages to that than just having some some sort of stranger taking care of you? Maybe. I, mean, I think it certainly depends on the stranger, though, you know. I, I think that we would all be better off if we were living a little bit more like a community. Maybe we don't need to be living in community houses, but friends helping each other babysit pitching in, family members being more around. I, I, I don't think that the way that many people are doing it now where women just go home and then are completely alone with a baby for six months and then go back to work and then the baby goes into some kind of facility. I, I don't think that's anywhere close to ideal. Doesn't and seem healthy. No, it, it, it doesn't. It really doesn't seem healthy to me. But that doesn't mean that women can't work or that all the burden should be on the mom, but maybe we shouldn't be living in such isolation. Yeah, I think definitely communities that are based on actual effective connections and like effective connections and not commerce is important because like, I mean, at a very basic level, like your family probably is going to love you. Like there's a bio, like it, it, something biologically happens when it's like your child or your niece or your grandchild, like, and you, you kind of no, sometimes sometimes people don't love their own children, which is tragic, but they almost always do. They, people almost always love their own children, and people very, very, very often love their, their, their children who are related to them. But if it's like 
a random stranger, like a random stranger who you're paying, they are probably not going to love your child. Or they're going to love your yeah, child a very small a lot of, of the time. In a very different there way. There are a lot of scandals out there where daycare workers have been caught beating the children and this kind of thing. Makes you worry. Yes. Uh, on the other hand, though, I do want to point out, though, that the most likely person to abuse your child is like a parent or a family member. And family is important and family is a good thing, but also child abuse is extremely common. And I don't think that people should just automatically bring in their parents or assume that their parents or their siblings would be good caregivers. You know, you hear a lot of, not only do you hear a lot of stories, but like most cases of child abuse and child molestation are within the family itself. And I don't think that we should discount friendships or chosen family in this, in this conversation. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. The, the, the biological connection thing is certainly maybe a, an advantage at first, but obviously, yeah, just having somebody who's, who's, yeah, who's trusted and who spends, um, you know, a, a large portion of the child's life with the child is, you know, could be, could, could potentially even be better than the parent, um, depending on if the parent is, is not a very good parent. Yeah. And I think once kids get older, like I think going off into an institution or going off into like a, a community setting outside of the, outside of the family is also extremely important. Like school. I think school is really important for kids. Yeah, that's a tough one. I, 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 I think question. I, I know some people don't like school, but school is done well, really weird. <laughs> school's, school's tough. I think it just really, really depends on the school. I would agree with you, though, that I think getting out of the house with your peer group, with adults who are not your parents, and, and being in, in something that's, that's different and more independent is important. Whether that's school or something else could be a debate. I'm not anti school. I actually had a really good experience in public school. <laughs> oh, I know maybe I'm a rarity there, but I, I think you can do that without school also. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I'm not anti-school or anything. I just think that the large majority of school could probably be done better. It, it's almost like school or not, it's almost at a certain point in a kid's life, there's like a hero's journey that has to take place. Like there's a certain stage where it's really important. It seems like it's really important for the kid to be around like loving, trusting people and to have, again, like not to generalize because some family is like really dysfunctional and stuff and some kids need to be separated from their mothers for various reasons. But I think in general, that is ideal to be close to a close family when they're really little. And then when they get a little bit older, like probably like six, I think six probably is a pretty good age for them to like go on a hero's journey and go outside the family and be around other children and to like struggle a little bit. And yeah, yeah. yeah Boy Scouts was really important in my life. I would say, I think that helped I, me. I, I tend to think that from the beginning, I think being in more of a community than just in a tight knit family would be better. And this isn't based on any kind of studies, but it is kind of based on maybe my vision of how humans evolved for the most part, like living in hunter gatherer tribes or living in communities. I think that, I think that it would be healthier to have more adult influences and to have kids just outside of your own sibling group around more often. You know, to like to, to, to mainly socialize with not just your parents day to day, but to be in some kind of a setting with multiple families, I think would be. Yeah. Amazing. People who you see a lot, people who you see enough to form a real connection with. Yes. Yes. But real connections more than just your family unit. I, I think that would be good for moms too. And, and maybe you could have then, it may, I, I don't know. I, I, I sometimes, I a lot of times think about single moms because there's so many single moms in the world and. I know it would be difficult to do this, but I, I think it would be great to see more single moms team up and you know help each other, like watch each other's kids while one goes back to work, et cetera. I, I wonder why people aren't doing that more. Maybe they just, it, it does seem like a little bit of a challenge. 
Like they say from an, from an evolutionary biology perspective again, like I'm sorry to keep going back to the evolutionary biology, but they say that that's probably a big part of the reason why um, – this is, like, you can question this from so many levels. It's very controversial. But they say it's a big part of the reason why women are more likely to be bisexual than men or why women are more sexually fluid. Because in like primordial times, again, like there was often, there was, there was very, like they, they think that there was probably not a situation where it was like a pair bonding. And then there was a lot of, especially in the very early times before people really separated into different cultures, it was probably there was not always a clear paternity to children. It was maybe more the males like providing for the whole community or helping out all the kids. And there wasn't so much of the focus of two parents on one child. So they say it was probably like a lot of like same, like same sex relationships between women that were like basically teaming up to raise their, their children together. I, it seems very plausible to me. It seems very plausible to me. You know, the, we're we're veering a little bit off topic here, but I think this is interesting. Uh, when you're talking about human happiness, one of the biggest predictors for human happiness and also longevity, like as much as diet and exercise, is strong community ties. Not just pair bonding ties, but strong community ties. I would believe that. It's tough. It seems like, what, like one way to look at it could be like in our culture, there's a lot of focus on commerce and economic activity and on succeeding as an individual, but there's not a lot of focus on, on community and on, and on children. So it ends up being the, the role of taking care of children just becomes a very low status economic job instead of it being something that a lot of people are contributing to communally. I, th I think it's also reflected in the way that elderly people are treated like it's like we ship the children off to the daycare and we ship the, the elderly off to the elderly care and everybody yeah like Ariel said it's like everybody who is or when their focus is on the economic t activity so if children can't do their economic stuff and the, the elderly can't well just you know forget about them <laughs> put them in an institution and I, it was interesting talk, talking to uh, our friend Seamus about this. Uh, he's from, he, he lived in Zambia for a long time. And he said that uh, one of the reasons that in the West people have less children is because they're not economically viable. Whereas in, in a lot of parts of Africa, say a, a woman is a housekeeper and she'll come in with her children and these are, these children are like five years old, but they'll already be working. They'll already be helping out, sweeping the floor or something like that. And that's, uh, yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a factor too. Yeah, yeah I, I, that's actually what I was going to say. I was going to say, I think it's weird how we draw this line at 18 and we say, you're an adult now, <laughs> you know, stop learning, start doing stuff, you know, and, and I think it should be much more gradual than that. I think it should be kind of like, oh, you're five, you can carry stuff, you know, <laughs> like, like you can't, maybe you can't, uh, you know, be the, C, be the CEO of a company, but you can, uh, you can certainly, you know, kind of gradually build up your skills and responsibilities until, yeah, until you are taking huge amounts of responsibility and solving all sorts of big problems. Sounds like age discrimination to me, Chris. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Sounds like child <laughs> labor to me. Absolutely. <laughs> it's tricky. It's yeah, tricky. It you know, that, that, that's, a, that's all very tricky. I, I'm curious. I, I've been thinking about this kind of throughout the conversation. I don't know if going to a more community-focused, child-centered lifestyle would increase or decrease bias against women in the workplace. I, I almost think that it would increase it sadly because if you I, I don't know like I think if you're going back to something more naturalistic we're talking about evolutionary biology you know tribal caregiving focus on community I think that you would find mostly women in those more community roles is that a bad thing is it just that we undervalue it Maybe it wouldn't work out that way. Maybe I'm showing my bias by thinking that women would end up mostly in those community-focused roles. What's, what's the strategy you're talking about? Sorry. If, 
if society went back more to like a multi-generational child focused living situation where we were engaging more in community there was more focus on child rearing i i think that you would see women more likely to be caregivers than men and maybe more likely to be at home caregivers than they are now i I can you maybe sketch out a little bit more detail what you're proposing here i guess it's not really a it's not really a big proposal um but i don't know If, if you had families living together and if you had a lifestyle where various families with kids were interacting day to day as opposed to these like compartmentalized family units where you have one or two providers caring for a home that's very isolated from the rest of the community and you know grandparents are in a facility and kids go to daycare if you were trying to bring it back to more of a community lifestyle where maybe it was more collaborative and maybe all of the community was caring for the kids do you think that I don't know. Do you think that that trend would affect women in the workforce positively or negatively? Or should that even be the priority? I think everybody w- would be a lot happier. Um, I do think we're moving towards a society. I mean, the, the average hours that people work um, per week has been going down since the you know industrial times when people were working like 18 hour days. And then, you know, there were unions and, and restrictions on labor and minimum wage and all that. And, uh, you know, it, 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 kind of, it kind of stopped going down around 40 hours a week because people need those jobs. People, people needed those, those full-time jobs in order to support their families. But I think you're, you're finally seeing a, a, a continuation of that trend where people are working less than 40 hours a week, um, especially in our generation. And I think if you can get to the point where, I mean, you're still going to have those high demand positions, you know, the, like president, you know, of the United States and, you know, CEOs of corporations and, you know, uh, just, just people have to be on call, doctors, you know, things like that. People have to be on call all the time. Um, but I think as we move towards a, 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 this sort of materially abundant society, um, where people don't need to, I mean, we have computers taking care of everything, you know, I mean, people just don't need to work as much to have the same level of comfort. Um, and yeah, I, I think um, we'll be, we'll be economically more able to move towards a society like you're talking about. Um, yeah, well, I'd like to see that like, you know, with say early retirement extreme or the four hour work week and this yeah. kind of thing, if if it, like men and women can be working such a small amount, they'll probably be full both be full time caregivers because why why not? I mean that's yep. kind of the most well, important I, thing. I think early retirement extreme and the four hour work week at this point are still a hack because of the fact that everybody else is working a lot. I don't think that society at, at large could do that. I think it will. I think you're seeing the trend uh, going increasingly in that direction. Eventually, eventually with artificial intelligence, I think we could. We've been working hours are going down over time. I had to look that up to verify it because I wasn't sure, but it does seem like in, in basically every developed country, the graph of working hours is going down and down and down. On average. Well, okay, that's the average engaged worker. However, you're having more and more women join the workforce. So the amount of hours being worked by society to care for society, I would guess are maybe actually increasing. I'm not sure we would have to look that up. Uh, I would say per person it's going down, but maybe- Per person it's going down, but the amount of actual work hours in society maybe going up. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, th- I also think it's cool to, um, to point out that it's Mother's Day today. <laughs> <laughs> we did talk a lot about mothers, so. Yes, it's not going to air for a while after Mother's Day, though, but happy Mother's Day, all the mothers. Happy Mother's Day, moms. Make sure to call none your mom. Are, none of us are parents either. It's worth noting. Yes, <laughs> it is worth noting that none of us are parents. We, we kind of went in a different direction there, but in, in terms of this gender bias, it, it does seem that it's, I think we can all agree that it's real. There is hiring discrimination against women. 
Yeah, especially that New York Times article about men, men having children and women having children. That that was a bit of an eye opener. It seems very well supported. Yeah, it, it seems like that there's definitely bias in, in hiring women versus hiring men. And I would say that a lot of it is unconscious bias uh, due to just, you know, growing up in a, in a world where, where more men are doing certain things and more women are, are doing certain things. Um, and then I would say that uh, the other part of it is, is just being rationally economic. And um, part of that is, is eliminating the uh, sort of stigma against women being in certain fields. And the other part of it might be uh, incentivizing men to take off work to sort of even out this risk calculus that we were talking about. Do we think men would take, like, like I'm curious now if, if men actually do take off as much in Scandinavian countries, because I was thinking about Katie's question, and I think, I think if, I think women do tend to be, gravi- I think do, women do tend to gravitate towards children more than men do, gravitate towards caring for children more, not I across think. the board, but as, as a tendency, I, I do, see, it, it, it feels correct to me to say that. I, I don't believe it's even, let me see, trends in. I think in the Scandinavian countries, or at least in one of them, I think incentives actually unequal. Like they're they're incentivizing men more to take time off. Yeah, I, I think it, what what happened is they they found that when they just had parental leave that could be divided between men and women as they wanted, women took off much more time than men. So then they've designated a specific amount. Certain countries have designated a specific amount of time has to be taken off by the father. Okay. Ah, uh, I yeah. see. Right. Well, in, yeah. in Australia, it's... It, we it's, should look at uh, more details on that and fight. Sure. We in should. Australia, either parent can collect 18 weeks of minimum wage pay for parental leave. That might be worth talking about a bit is like this idea of what we think about the kind of um, the equity doctrine social engineering like this idea to try to go in and try to preferentially hire women or preferentially give men time off to take care of their kids like what do we think about that so i was going to bring this up earlier i think that actually might be part of the unconscious bias thing that we're seeing because if say there's some kind of affirmative action happening and one group is artificially favored over another group then people in the industry who are hiring those people are going to kind of start thinking like, oh, well, if, if, two men, if, a man, if a man and a woman appear similar on paper, then the woman has, a, has basically a lower chance of being as good because she somehow, you know, uh, got favored by the system and she really isn't as good as the man. Even if, even if she is, there might be sort of a, 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 a perception that somehow she cheated. That, that, that can happen. I think that can happen. It's difficult to study, but yeah, I, I think if you're trying to push for quotas or something like that, there, there can then be a perception. It, it could increase the perception that women are less competent than men because then there's the question of, did she get into this position by her merit or not? Whereas otherwise you, you would not have that question. An, another thing that I thought would be interesting to bring up here when we're talking about countries trying to push for more gender equality. There's a paradox that's been noted a few times that in countries with more gender equality, like the Nordic countries, Sweden, for example, it, it seems like the, the more gender equality there is, the, the higher gender parity in, in education and, and, and policies in terms of parental leave and everything, you actually get less women going into STEM fields and women men and women tend to sort into stereotypical gender career choices even more than in countries like the United States. You even get um, personality testing becomes, the spread becomes bigger between men and women. That's a really interesting Is effect. It in, in terms of Myers-Briggs or what kind of personality test? Big five. Yeah, this is a point that Jordan Peterson often brings up, that once you give like in the Scandinavian countries, men and women, more economic freedom to choose the, the path that they want to lead in life. There's, there's, a, there's an even larger discrepancy between the jobs that women gravitate towards and the jobs that men gra- gravitate towards. 
Yeah. I mean, it's another interesting thing. Like, I feel like I keep arguing against the gender difference stuff. I actually do think there are inherent gender differences, but I think in a study like this also, it's important to note that the study authors cautioned against using this to imply a purely hereditary interpretation and that correlation doesn't equal causation. So like- Maybe the sociocultural effects are just much stronger, you know, than we thought. It, well, they, well, I could think of a few possible explanations. I mean, for one thing, they looked at across all age groups. So they were looking at 90-year-olds as well as 15-year-olds. Like it would One thing would be interesting is to be to separate those groups and to look at people who were socialized more recently versus people who were socialized in like the 1940s and 50s. Another thing that they didn't do is they didn't look at the overall spread of the entire population across like personality tests and job choice, which would have been an important control, you'd think. And another thing I can think of is there might be a third cause that's producing this disparity. Like one that immediately jumped to mind for me is wealthy Western countries tend to have a lot of video games. And there's a lot of evidence that playing video games trains your spatial abilities and increases interest in things over people. So that could be a third causation. Like there, there's, when you have a correlation and you don't know whether there's a causation, there's always a possibility that there's a third factor that's causing both, both correlated variables that you're measuring. Interesting. So what you're saying is that young boys in Western countries play tons of video games, which makes them gravitate even more towards jobs, I guess, or roles in society that favor those skills. There's been like a, there's a there was like a study that where they measured um, kids' uh, spatial abilities, and I don't think we mentioned this, but there's a pretty well established finding that uh, males tend to have a higher spatial intelligence and women tend to have higher verbal intelligence. Mm-hmm. And so they measured kids' spatial abilities as they expected. They found the boys had better spatial abilities in this particular metric they were measuring. But then when they got the girls to play, when they got both kids to play video games for 10 hours, the boys had already been playing video games, then it equalized. Not to say that video games are necessarily good because I think there's a lot of drawbacks to playing a lot of video games, but that could be a factor. That's very yeah. interesting. That. And this, this hooks into all that. That could be a factor. Uh, in, in the study that I was just reading, another speculate on the flip side, a, a counter argument to the speculations that you were making about things like video games and some of these sociocultural factors. Um, some of, they were speculating that some of the reason might be that perhaps in countries with stronger social welfare, there's less incentive or, or less concern for women to go into like fields that they know are going to be secure and higher paying like STEM fields and they're more likely to pursue their interests. Yeah, that's possible. Yeah, this, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, there's, there's so many possibilities. There's, a, there's really, it's, it's complicated too. Like when you say that women aren't in STEM, cause like women are actually like really likely, like I think female physicians are all, like in Western countries, female physicians have, become more, you think, match to ma- match male physicians now? So in some areas, like like the biological sciences, women are very well represented. So it's a little bit more complicated even than saying men are in STEM and women are not in STEM. Right, right. Well, and then we would want to ask about what type of doctor because doctor is also a very people-facing and could be considered a very caregiving, traditional feminine role if we want to play that counter argument. You can definitely argue that. This, yeah. this ties into um, the, the thing that you were talking about with video games. Uh, there was a big scandal uh, a few years back called Gamergate, where um, there were all of these female uh, journalists, gamers, journalists, who were talking about how um, games tend to be really sexist and game communities tend to be really sort of boys clubs. And um, it, it would be interesting to see, I mean, so there was this you know, big fight and all this backlash and stuff. And, um, but it would be interesting to see what would, how it would affect society if more, if games were more geared towards women, and uh, like during those formative years uh, of their lives. Now, of course, that brings up you know, well, you know, uh, the James Damore memo, and like, well, yeah, that's condescending. You know, why, why, sh- why shouldn't we just expect women to just be interested in the the, boy- the games that the boys are? Are playing you know why do we have to gear it towards women you know why can't we just have more women involved so. and and, and it, beca- it becomes a thing of like the chicken and egg like do, video- do boys play video games more because they're interested in things or do or do boys play games more because you know the hero tends to be this like big muscly guy holding a gun like mm-hmm. well and it, it tends to be that the the people programming and, and making the games are men um, so 
you know, if you had more women game designers and game developers, then I'm sure you would probably have more women playing the games. Yeah. Every level feeds into every other level. It's extremely complicated. (laughs) It's extremely, extremely complicated. And I think Chris, me made some good points about how some of these social engineering things can backfire. Like you can get, you can get employers being like, assuming that a female candidate is less qualified because there'll be some affirmative action down the line. And I've even seen situations where you sometimes see parents who are like really trying to push a girl towards like boyish things. And there's almost like a rebellion against that. Like, no, I will play with my doll. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I could see that. I I had a lot of, I I was strong in, in math and science. Well, particularly strong in math as a kid. And so I was heavily, heavily pushed into math by everyone around me, but it wasn't the thing that I liked the most at all. So that, that became a really big kind of identity issue for me later. And I was equally strong in all the other subjects. It was just, they saw that I was strong in math and I was a girl that was strong in math. So it was like be an engineer. I had zero interest whatsoever. I I wonder what, what would have made you more interested or is it just, you just, I, well, Absolutely. I don't, I don't know. I think if I, like for myself personally, and I don't think this is so much a male female thing, but if I had been maybe exposed to other career choices that, that weren't engineering, uh, I, I, I was never really mechanically inclined or, or good with like physical things. So if I had been, maybe, maybe if people had been trying to push me into theoretical physics, then I would have been more interested in that. <laughs> Noted. I don't know. Well, that was just me. Okay. Yeah. Like one thing that's rough about all this is it's, it's kind of like a level two chaotic system. Like a level two chaotic system is a system where, well, a level one chaotic system is a system like the weather where it's chaotic. Like there can be butterfly effect and it's hard to predict what's going to happen, but by observing it and by acting on it, you don't change it. Whereas something like the stock market is a level two objective system, a level two chaotic system where when you act, it alters the system itself. And this is a level two chaotic system where it's like the approach that we take can determine the nature, like alters the nature of the problem. Like, you know, talking about child gender preferences and stuff like this and people being pressured in different fields, like there's a temptation just to say like, live and let live, let people do whatever they want to, let people act however they want to, and the cards will unfold as they will. But the problem is, like, if there really is, and there does seem to be, like, this endemic, endemic gender discrimination, then people can't really pursue what they want to pursue. Like, there are these, these artificial limitations do exist. And, yeah. and it's not really as free as it seems. But then if we try to, like, socially engineer around those differences, like, if we say, okay, there's discrimination, so we'll have affirmative action. There's people... There's bias in how people treat children, so we'll directly counter that bias and push girls to be actiony and push boys to be more nurturing. Like it, it creates all these un- unintended side effects, which also seem to make things less free. And there's backlashes, and there's all it causes all these knots in the system. So it's it, it seems like like we've we've established that there's a problem, but it doesn't seem clear what the solution is. So I, I think a lot of the complaints that people have. Um, about the labor market are moot if you're an entrepreneur. If you go out and solve a problem for somebody, then uh, you know you, you can just you can limit yourself to all women clients. You know, <laughs> you can limit yourself to only women employees. And you know this is especially true in something like the internet or Bitcoin. You know, where where the platform itself is gender agnostic, right? Or you know, it's basically identity agnostic. Um, if if there were more women, I think, or people, people of, I don't know, uh, sort of non, non-majority um, uh, identities going out and starting their own companies, which you do see, you do see some of. Um, but, but I think, you know, when you're, when you're working for yourself, it, it makes no difference what society's biases are. All you have to do, I mean, there, there might be some, you know, it, you, like the, people might be biased, like your clients might be biased. Uh, and you might have to do a little more work to find clients who um, who aren't biased. Um, but if you're if you're providing real value in the market, um, those people are just hurting themselves by not working with you. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so I think, and I think there is something innate about women that makes them less likely to go be entrepreneurs. Um, I think a lot of that is cultural also, um, but I think maybe, maybe there should be some kind of push towards uh, women founding their own companies. I think more female, more women in entrepreneurship would be great, but I really need to push back against that because if you're an entrepreneur, I think that bias can hurt you even more. And I think female entrepreneurs face a lot more difficulty getting any kind of funding. You have a lot more difficulty getting any kind of respect in the marketplace. And it, I guess it depends on what kind of business that you're running. If you're creating a physical product, then that's going to be sold in sores, then maybe your end consumer isn't going to know that you're a, a woman producing it. But it, in a lot of cases, trying to get a new product or good or service out there is so much about networking. And there's so much more networking that you need to do if you're an entrepreneur than if you're just an employer trying, an employee trying to get hired by one person. I would think that the effect would be even worse. Um. Because you, you have to you have to you have to deal with that bias with every single new client. I mean, again, the, the way that the way that Bitcoin company companies work is they have a website, they have a white paper, <laughs> you know, they 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 um, they a lot of times they self fund, you know, they just earn some money, invest it, you know, the, the market, you know, they they hit it big, you know, by making some good investment, and then uh, and then they hire some employees and they get shit done. Also, um, there, you, there are, and there you can't are women limit yourself to just female employees. That would be illegal basically everywhere. Uh, and Bitcoin is a really, really narrow niche market. And who the, 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 the founders of the project have a great deal to do with what projects become, become popular and take off, e even in that space, and maybe even especially in that space. But, you, know, you know what, though? I think I, think I am going to... I think I'm going to like stand up a little bit for what Chris is saying because I, I agree with Katie that there, if anything, the gender bias would be magnified in a situation of entrepreneurship. But I also think that like part of, part of the solution to these kind of problems is inevitably going to be like, like female success. And, and I know it's, it's we, we, like it, the top down approach just seems so flawed and it's like there's so many negative side effects to it yeah basically what you're but saying it, it really it really does see, seem like like women going out in the world and like proving that they can succeed and overcoming it against the odds like i guess one thing about this conversation that i really hope is not a takeaway from it is i don't want people to watch this conversation and just become defeatist and be like oh there's bias i'm not gonna apply for a job i'm not gonna try whatever yeah. the world sucks because you know it's like Yes, there is a bias, like there's a bias against women, and we didn't talk about in this episode, but there's also a bias against racial minorities. There's a bias against all kinds of different identities you can have. But whatever, whatever handicap the bias produces is never going to be as big a handicap as not trying at all. And I do think that trying and succeeding, even if you're not someone who people, like breaking people's expectations is part of the way the world changes. Yeah, exactly. Basically, Katie, what you're saying is, you know, well, women, we can't expect women to be entrepreneurs because that's hard. <laughs> no, I did not say and that it's at like, all. It's I did like not being, say that. Being an was, entrepreneur stop, stop, is stop, hard. Stop, 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 stop. Right, I did I'm, not say that. A hundred percent zero because that's what I want women to do. I would never say that. What I was fighting what against was when you were saying- when you were, hard. Okay. No, what, like no, by definition, it's hard. You're solving yeah. a difficult problem. You're trying to find a market. You're trying to build a product and you're trying to get people, you're trying to get buyers. Hang on. What I was saying is you were saying that if women become entrepreneurs, then they won't have to deal with this because they'll be providing valuable service. And I was saying that I think that the gender bias would be magnified if women became entrepreneurs. Yeah. However, I do think that the solution to this, I 100% agree with Ariel, not the solution, but one of the main solutions is for women to go out and be badasses and be entrepreneurs because whatever the bias is against you, if you can fight against the stereotypes that are against you and maintain personal confidence and maintain motivation, you as an individual can be greater and stronger than the bias that's against you. And unfortunately, as a society, if we want these biases to change, the main thing that's going to do it, you know, we have to confront our own biases and look within ourselves and try to people, treat people as individuals. But also we need to see women being successful and, and not being beaten down by these things. And you, I think that's the best possible thing that you could ever do is that you could do is just say, okay, 
these biases exist. I know this is what I'm up against. I'm stronger than that. I'm going to do it anyway. Exactly. And, and, and do it and, and, and prove it wrong. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I could not have put that better. Okay. That's, I definitely exactly would not say to women, there's bias against you, so don't do anything. It, I also think that, that this, these biases that we're talking about when they're measured, we think maybe they're 10%, maybe a little bit stronger in terms of hiring biases and like how women are rated in terms of competence. You can definitely put in 10% more work than the average guy and be 10% better than the average. You can definitely way overcompensate for whatever bias is going to be against you. It's, it's overcomable. Right. And, and it, it, like exactly as you implied, like, or exactly as Ariel was saying, you know, like just like only having a, a top down approach where we say, okay, well let's bias women is not going to solve the problem. Uh, or let's, let's, let's favor women. You know, that's not going to solve the problem. Like th there, there needs to also be an, an upswelling of, of women who are, as you said, badasses who are, who are, um, who are aware of all of the even greater challenges that they might have um, than men and succeed anyway. And, and part of it is like, once you know how some of these dynamics work, you can, you can kind of counteract them. Like, like one thing I think about is there is a study that when a man looks at a job application, He'll, he'll apply for a job if he has, if there's like six qualifications and he has one, he'll apply. Whereas a woman, if she looks at the same job, app, job application, she'll only apply if she has all six qualifications. And so men tend to get, that's one of the reasons why men tend, tend to get better jobs is because they're, they're reaching more in what they're applying for. But if you're aware of that and you're a woman, you could be like, okay, I'm just going to do what the guys do. I'll just apply for jobs that I feel I'm unqualified for and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ironically, when I was looking for my first job, it was my sister that told me, uh, no, just ignore the qualifications, <laughs> apply for whatever. <laughs> I've been basically unqualified for every job I've ever had in terms of the listed qualifications. <laughs> I, I stopped every applying jobs time. after a while. I was just like, you know what? I don't feel like impressing. <laughs> I don't feel like impressing somebody that I'm going to go work for. I'm just going to go work for myself. Yeah. Yeah, entrepreneurship is a great thing. Going out against biases is a, gr is a great thing. Acknowledge that there's, we, we should acknowledge that it's more difficult and that there are some things stacked against women and, and other discriminated against groups, which we haven't covered in this episode. There are some things stacked against you, but that does not mean it's insurmountable. And the more people surmount it, the more examples of successful women will have and the less the bias will exist in the future. It's not to say that social policy, yeah, it's about like looking at reality, how it actually is and acknowledging it in all its ugliness, but not allowing yourself to be defeated by it and being open to a wide range of possible ways to address it, be it through social policy, through individual um, heroism and achievement through community-based responses. Yeah, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of being a successful entrepreneur, uh, from what I've read, <laughs> is you do have to be a little bit too optimistic. Um, and, and that uh, feature of men versus women when they're looking at the job application and men are like, oh, I can get this job. I only have one of the applications. Uh, I think that's kind of the same thing as what it takes to be an entrepreneur. You're kind of like, well, I can kind of do some of this stuff. So yeah, I'm definitely going to succeed. So, so maybe you fail a few times, right? But then eventually, if you just persist and you keep trying, eventually you succeed, as long as you're learning from your, from your failures. Yeah, that's a funny thing, because people these days talk about that Dunning-Kruger effect about how incompetent people rate their abilities higher. But when I, I used to read quite a lot of Tony Robbins, and that was like, one of the qualities he listed as successful people, like you're, you're incompetent, but you don't care. You're going to, you know, put all, put your all into it anyway. <laughs> so, you know, people don't t talk about that aspect of it. Like this. There's research that shows that men, ex that men display the Dunning Kruger, Kruger effect more than women. So a guy will think he knows a lot about something and he doesn't or act like he does when he doesn't. And, that's probably behind some of the irritation behind mansplaining. But. Yes. Well, there's that 
common trope, fake it till you make it. And the Dunning-Kruger effect basically lets you fake it really, really well because <laughs> you actually believe it. Yeah. Men are more likely to overestimate their ability. Women are more likely to underestimate it. Women are also le- more likely to suffer from imposter syndrome and think that they don't deserve the achievements that they do get. I think maybe some of that is biological, but I honestly would be surprised if most of that wasn't sociocultural. The the self-confidence, because it seems to go down as, as girls get older and Sorry, the self-confidence goes down or the self-doubt goes down? Self-confidence goes down. So it is or, or Sorry, control. yes. Yeah, women's, or like, young girls tend to rate their ability similar to young boys, but then as they get older. So you're saying there's a, there's a large cultural effect on that? I think so. Okay. It, it could I, be I biological, but point. I think there's a large cultural effect. You could interpret it a bunch of different ways. Anyway, I, I, I think we're at a good place to, to wrap up here with, with some, we've gone through a lot of the evidence. We've gone through a lot of the issues. We've explored many different sides of the debate and some possible solutions. Does, does anybody else, does anyone have something they'd like to add to this discussion before we wrap up? Mothers are extremely important. Happy Mother's Day. Okay. Well, Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of the Multiversity. I, I've had a really great time on this episode. I feel like I learned a lot in preparation and during the episode. This is a complicated issue that deserves to be handled a little bit delicately. I'm sure we got some things wrong, but I think that there was value here. And, and I do believe that there is a lot of value in discussing these issues openly because that's how we move forward. And I I hope we've moved forward a little bit today, at least personally. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you for joining us on The Multiversity. We hope you found this episode both mind-bending and enjoyable. We can be found all over the social media space and at multiversitypodcast.com. If you like this content, give us a like, comment, follow, share, or support us on Patreon. Catch you on the flip side. 